Okay, we are live here at Myth Vision Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for an electrifying debate that will maybe shake the foundations of your beliefs. Our panel of experts will delve deep into the question of whether the Bible condones slavery. With passionate arguments and thought-provoking insights, this debate will have you uh, questioning everything you thought you knew. This is a must-watch event for anyone interested in religion, history, and social justice. Does the Bible condone slavery? or not. I imagine definitions will get brought up during this discussion. And with that being said, welcome. I am uh, super excited. Let's get our short little intro going, and I'm hoping that more people will tune in. Welcome to Myth Vision, everybody. We have some special guests joining us for a debate on whether or not the Bible condones slavery. I'm your host, and I'm going to be platforming, uh, hopefully not getting in anybody's way during this debate um, on the issue. And I want to introduce both sides. So we have the side that's saying that the Bible does not condone slavery. I imagine that'll be spelled out. And that is by Dr. Boyce. And uh, Stephen Boyce and Jonathan Beasley below, can you introduce yourselves for the audience in case they don't know who you gentlemen are? Yeah, I'll start. I am John Beasley. I'm co-founder of Explore Christianity. My studies are in the field of um, theology and Bible. I've been a pastor for um, a little over a decade, and um, I since have moved out of the pastor to really focus on this Explore Christianity ministry, where we try to create a platform for people who are struggling with their faith and even skeptical about faith to be able to have a good conversation. So I'm excited about this conversation to be able to ha be had as well. Stephen. Yep. I'm Stephen Boyce. Um, and I'm the other co-founder of Explore Christianity. We have a group of apologists that major in, in different avenues, different studies. Some guys are predominantly old Testament. Most of mine is actually in, in the new Testament canonicity. Much of my doctoral work was focused actually on the Gnostic gospels. Uh, but yeah, we, we have founded this ministry in order to speak at churches, also engage people on the side, have discussions and allow people to wrestle with doubt and allow people to wrestle with questions. Uh, cause we believe that's actually a healthy thing. So that is a big part of our ministry. And, and I know that, uh, Derek, you put our, our website in the link as yes. well. If people want to learn more about us, see some of the other debates we've done our podcast. I run a podcast called facts. Um, and you can download that on any of the, the major lines there. And if there's anything I need to add later, gentlemen, feel free to shoot the links over to me because, you know, we were all discombobulated today. And I'll be happy to add that in the description so people could find that. Now to the team that is saying, yes, the Bible does condone slavery, and that will get spelled out, is uh, Dr. Kip and Dr. Josh. Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I'll go. That's fine. Um, my name is uh, Kip Davis. Uh, most people probably know me from my YouTube channel, which is very creatively titled Kip Davis. And I create, uh, <laughs> videos about, uh, the Bible and, uh, counter apologetics. I am a biblical scholar and a specialist in early Judaism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I earned my PhD at the university of Manchester. I had postdoctoral appointments in Norway in Canada, where I also taught university courses. Um, I'm also probably most well known from my work in the Dead Sea Scrolls forgeries, which has been featured in popular media outlets. And uh, I have published widely, uh, academically and popularly. Thank you. And I'm happy to be here. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Josh. Um, I help my wife, uh, who, uh, Megan Lewis, who runs, uh, the YouTube channel, Digital Hammurabi. Uh, we both went to Johns Hopkins. Um, I got my PhD there in Assyriology with a minor in Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, before that I got a master's of theology and old Testament studies. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I also do counter apologetics, um, 
and most of what I do is uh, just trying to go to the Old Testament and the ancient Near East and say what 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 was actually there, what can we actually say about it, um, and so I've got several books out in that vein, uh, probably like most notably or for this discussion is did the Old Testament endorse slavery, uh, and then I've got two volumes out on in the uh, series the atheist handbook to the old testament so also happy to be here thank you so much i really appreciate you guys um i want to make sure that you guys are uh good to go and we're going to be doing just for audience's sake we're going to be doing a 15 minute opening each team will get a chance 15 minutes to open to make their case and we're going to let those who have the affirmative go first. So Dr. Josh and Dr. Kipp will go first and saying, yes, it does affirm or, or condone, sorry, the Bible condones slavery. Then we'll allow Dr. Boyce and uh, AKA, I said this before the uh, live stream, AKA Dr. Beasley. Uh, uh, of course, yes. we're joking. <laughs> I gave it to you. I gave it to you. Thank you, Thank you Derek. No problem. Write the check later. Um, so <laughs> you gentlemen, you gentlemen will be... Um, having 15 minutes each and then our we we're going to call it an open dialogue for this one hour after that five minute closing each side then we'll do q a so super chat your questions and we will get your questions answered at the end i will be disappearing like casper the friendly ghost during their cross discussion that way i'm not in the in the way as i am right now on the screen and it'll fit better you can see their pretty faces so with that being said uh dr josh and dr kip you guys go first and if you want to share your screen um i'm going to get my timer you might want to get your timer out as well to be prepared is it on all right. It, I think I see it. And yes, it is. And all I ask is that uh, everybody uh, who's on the panel, mute your mic in case kids, we all have families and, you know, just to make sure that nobody's interrupting potentially for the uh, presentation. And um, I'm ready when you are Kips. Let me know when and we'll, we'll start. All or is right. it Josh? Are you going first? Yeah, I'll, I'll be reading. He'll be doing the clicking. <clears throat> okay. Ready, set, go. The presence of laws relating to slavery in the Bible are often quite jarring to believer and unbeliever alike. How could a text, either divinely inspired by God or standing at the heart of an all-pervasive religion, contain laws that endorse the appropriate practice of slavery? What was slavery like as described in the Hebrew Bible? Were the Old Testament laws, in fact, structured to support and promote the practice of debt and chattel slavery? How did these laws compare to those from other ancient Near Eastern nations? If there was genuine slavery in the laws of the Old Testament, did the New Testament do away with this practice? Let's define some important terms. While the word slavery can have nuanced meanings in the context in which the word appears, uh, it, is, sorry, it is the context in which the word appears that determines its meaning. In the context under discussion, we will define slavery as a condition in which an individual, or rights to their labor, is owned by another, either temporarily or permanently. The owner controls and benefits from the actions and activities of the owned individual. The topic of this debate is, does the Bible condone slavery? And in that vein, we should also discuss the word condone. If we're using the term to mean to approve or sanction something, then the word describes well what the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, did concerning slavery. However, there is another, perhaps more common nuance, which is to accept or allow something to continue that is considered to be immoral. In this sense, we would argue that the biblical text did not condone slavery, and this would imply that the practice was, as this would imply that the practice was considered to be immoral in the various legal sections of the Hebrew Bible. It is not. Exodus 21, 2 to 6 contains laws concerning the male Israelite debt slave, the Evid Ivri. He is able to be kept for six years and released in the seventh. Stipulations are in place concerning his wife and children, which depend upon whether he came into slavery married, literally the Baali Shah, owner of a woman, or was given a woman by his owner. If so given, the woman and children remain chattel slaves upon the man's release. 
The man himself could become a chattel slave if he wished to remain with his woman and children, and he would then serve his master for life. Verses 7 through 11 concern the female slave, an ama, who was sold by her father into either concubinage or marriage. She is not to be released as the male debt slaves were, although this is to ensure a form of protection for her, as her value has been greatly diminished, having been deflowered by her buyer or his son. If she becomes displeasing to the buyer, uh, or he takes another ama, she is not to be denied certain provisions. If these are not provided, she is to be allowed to be redeemed and cannot be sold to foreigners as a slave. In Exodus 21, 20 to 21, we see a law regulating the beating of one slave. If the master beat the slave so severely that the slave died immediately, verse 20, then there would be severe punishment, likely death. However, if the slave did not die immediately, but survive for a day or two, then, according to this logic, the intent of the master was likely not murderous, and there was no punishment. In verses 26 and 27, we read, An owner who hits a male or female slave, an evid or an ama, in the eye and destroys it, must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And an owner who knocks out the tooth of a male or female slave must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. In the preceding verses, the text is elaborating on the principle of talion, generally designated lex talionis or the law of retaliation. If a slave were on equal footing with the master before the law, we would expect to read something akin to an owner who hits his male or female slave in the eye and destroys it will have his own eye destroyed. However, the principle of retali uh, retaliation, that the slave would have the right to the eye of the master, is not in play here. The slave is protected by the law, at least in theory, from abuse and excessive beatings. If they are killed as a, dir a direct result of a beating, it is considered murder, and the slave is likely to be killed. Uh, sorry, and the master is likely to be killed. If the master destroys or puts out an eye or tooth, the slave is forgiven their debt and set free. Deuteronomy 15 speaks of Hebrew slaves, Ha'ivri and Ha'ivriya, who serve for six years and are released in the seventh. The slave is also able to voluntarily serve for life, and a ritual is performed on that occasion. Different from Exodus 21, the laws here in Deuteronomy pertain not only to the Hebrew man, Ha'ivri, but also to the Hebrew woman, Ha'ivriya. In this passage, the woman is also to be released, or is allowed to remain a slave for life. More significantly, however, is the command for the master to provide a substantial amount of goods to the newly freed slave. The overall tone of the passage is one of encouraging the master not to hold back from his slave, because the Ivri is his brother, Achicha. As God has supernaturally blessed and provided for his people, he will continue to do so if they keep his covenant. In like manner, the master should also give generously to the Hebrew slave and be supernaturally blessed thereby. In Leviticus 25, the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 through 7, contains God's command to let the land of Israel have a year-long rest from farming every seventh year. The next section commands the people to also hold a year of rest every 50th year. They were to have seven Sabbath years, totaling 49 years, followed by a Jubilee in the 50th year. During this year of the Jubilee, people were be to be returned to their land and debts were to be canceled. This applied to the Israelites, the Bnei Israel. Following verses 18 to 22, which describe God's supernatural provision if they would obey his commands, we come to the critical section of the chapter for our purposes, laws concerning Israelites that become poor, 25 to 55. There are three scenarios that are discussed in these verses with respect to an Israelite. In the first, because Israelites owned property in the land of Israel, if they fell into poverty, selling a portion of their land was a viable option. The law required, however, that the land would eventually return to its original owner, either by a near relative redeeming it for them or during the year of Jubilee. 
In the second scenario, it appears that the Israelite has already sold his property and cannot make ends meet. Should this occur, the poor Israelite was to be cared for by their fellow Israelites, who were to loan them what they needed at no interest. They were to fear and obey God by supporting their poor brother, with the result that God would supernaturally provide for them because of their obedience. In the third scenario, the Israelite actually reaches a stage where he must sell himself into debt slavery. However, they are not to be treated as slaves or as an Eved. In contrast to Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 15, where it was perfectly legitimate to keep an Israelite as a slave, this is no longer allowed in Leviticus 25. If Israelites can no longer purchase fellow Israelites as slaves, a natural question arises in this context. Where should they get slaves? And as for your male slaves and female slaves, your Evid and your Ama, that you may have from the foreign nations that are around you, from them you may purchase male and female slaves. And even from the tenant foreigners, the Toshavim, that are living with you, from them you may purchase, even from their families who are with you, whom they have borne in your land, and they will be your inherited property. And you may bequeath them to your sons after you to receive as inherited property. You can make them serve permanently. But as for your brothers, the children of Israel, the Bnei Israel, you must not, not rule over one another with violence. Leviticus 25, 44 to 46. We learn from these verses that, one, chattel slaves can be purchased from the foreigners living in the nations around Israel and from foreign tenant farmers living in Israel. Two, these slaves become their property. Three, that property can be passed on as inheritance to their children. And four, they can be made to serve as slaves for life. In short, the Israelites were given special treatment as God's slaves. Because they already had a master, God himself, they could not be treated as slaves by another master. Instead, they were to be treated as hired workers, whether under the control of an Israelite or foreign master. God's supernatural provision would ensure that this would be economically viable. In contrast to this, foreign slaves were able to be purchased, kept as property, passed on as inheritance, and made to serve for life. We should note that in this presentation, we have been making a deliberate point of emphasizing the terminology throughout these texts as a means of demonstrating the crucial significance of these words the nuances of which are so often lost in translation. This is because words matter. The Bnei Yisrael, the Israelites, the Ivri and Ivriya, the Hebrews, are a distinct group of free people, and they are always distinguished from foreigners, the Toshavim, and from slaves, both male, Eved, and female, Ama. Likewise, within Iron Age Israelite culture, there are important distinctions to be made in the status and identity uh, of female humans. When a girl is born to an Israelite or Hebrew, she is a daughter, a bot. She remains a daughter under the rule of her father until she is given to another man, and she becomes a woman or a wife, an isha, belonging to an ish, who has quite literally taken her lakach. She may otherwise be sold, in which case she becomes a slave, an ama. At no point in any of these transactions does she exercise her own agency. And while her standing in the community may differ from one distinction to the other, in virtually all of these instances, she remains the property of a man she did not choose and satisfies many aspects of our definition of a slave. Words matter. While we cannot spend a great deal of time in the New Testament, it is important to briefly touch on some of the key passages that come up in this discussion. In Matthew 19, 3 to 9, Jesus notes that Moses allowed the Israelites to divorce their wives because their hearts were hard. This is seen as a principle to be more broadly applied to other aspects of the law. Divorce was not God's ideal, but he allowed it because of man's sinfulness, and this can be applied to slavery as well. But can this be tied to slavery? Do we see Jesus and the New Testament writers speaking out against slavery? It must be noted that, quite to the contrary, in the collections of literature that survive from Jesus' Jewish contemporaries in the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
we see not only no condemnation of the institution of slavery, but rather its ongoing maintenance through additional laws and stipulations. Jews living in this idealized community at Qumran are not permitted to sell their slaves, both Evid and Amma, to Gentiles, as with all their property and holdings. One is pressed to wonder at this, if God's ideal was always for all men and women to be free, then why is this not remotely obvious to the readers of the Hebrew Scriptures? If the Old Testament and Dead Sea Scrolls endorsed the practice of slavery, did the New Testament condemn it? To show such a condemnation, several common passages are cited by apologists. Setting aside general statements about loving one another, Paul's letter to Philemon often appears early in the conversation. 1 Timothy 1, 9-10 is also frequently cited, where slave traders are listed along with other sinful behaviors. Finally, Galatians 3.28 is regularly quoted where, in Christ, there is neither slave nor free. Galatians 3.28 is a positional truth and was in no way intended to do away with the social institution of slavery, any more than the practical distinctions between Jew and Gentile or male and female in the same verse. 1 Timothy 1.10 condemns the illegal acquisition or kidnapping of persons, as did other nations at the time. If 1 Timothy 1.10 was meant to condemn the central, social institution of slavery, then it had already been condemned by secular sources of the time. Finally, the book of Philemon offers no overarching declaration on the institution of slavery. Loza writes concerning this view, quote, For good reasons, this view has found no acceptance and today is no longer held by anyone. The letter to Philemon is neither the disguise of a general idea nor the promulgation of a generally valid rule about the question of slavery, end quote. At best, it would seem, it provides evidence of Paul encouraging Philemon to forgive and free his runaway slave in order that Onesimus might return to Paul to help him in the ministry. In no way is it a broad directive against owning other human beings as slaves. The topic of slavery is one that makes us uncomfortable, and yet it comes up time and again in discussions about morality and the God of the Bible. The reason for this is that what the Bible says about slavery is at the very least extremely uncomfortable. We would do well, whether as believer or atheist, to understand what the Bible actually says about the practice of slavery, rather than building our conclusions and positions on faulty arguments or apologetics in an effort to ignore what is plainly, obviously right there in the text. Slavery was indeed endorsed, not even merely condoned, in the Old Testament, and the New Testament did not condemn its practice. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate the presentation. <clears throat> and thank you for the other team helping me with the time. I had a mishap happen with my phone. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Now we're going to be switching sides. We're going to allow 15 minutes. Um, Dr. Boyce or Bees, AKA, AKA. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I see your presentation is ready to share. And, uh, or it seems, are you doing a presentation for the opening? I am, yes. Let me uh, not mess this up too much. Here we go. Let me know when it's um, good okay. to go. Well, you just got to. There we go. Sweet. Yep. You just have to share the PowerPoint or uh, keynote or whatever, like you did before. There you go. Okay. Great. I'll start your timer when you say go. Awesome. Okay. Well, first, let me just say thank you, Dr. Josh, for that presentation. I have read your book, actually both the books that you've published, uh, the Atheist Handbook and the um, book on slavery directly, and it's been uh, really good. I appreciate the amount of work that you put into it and certainly had learned some things from your book, so thanks for that presentation. All right, Derek, ready? I'm ready to go. Ready? Let's go. If you take the passages that regulate the practice of slavery in the Old Testament in isolation and the admonition to towards slaves and masters in the New Testament, it would seem reasonable to condone that God does in fact, or to conclude rather, that God does in fact condone slavery. In the covenant code that Dr. Josh was mentioning, Exodus 21, the first case law is related to slaves and being, and, and, and begins by saying, when you buy a Hebrew slave, now it could be argued that from that phrase that... Now, it could be argued that from that phrase, Israel um, was never commanded, per se, to buy slaves. But it does say, hey, when you buy a slave, 
you could maybe make the case that the conditions laid out in the covenant code provide improved conditions for slavery compared to other ancient Near East law codes. However, you're still left with the fact that slavery is not abolished, but rather regulated and implemented in the law. We go to another legal passage that was mentioned prior, Leviticus 25, verse 44. Israel is instructed that if they buy or purchase slaves, they are to purchase from the other nations. Leviticus 25, 46 says, um, you can bequeath them to your children an inheritance, an inherited property, and can make them slaves for life. And make sure that you guys are seeing these verses here. There's that verse that I just quoted. So we see from two legal passages, when you buy a Hebrew slave, when you go to uh, purchase from the nations, they can be an in, uh, inherited property. Seems to be pretty clear the Bible is endorsing slavery. As a matter of fact, looking all through the Old Testament, slavery is everywhere. All the patriarchs own slaves, their wives own female slaves. So it's pretty clear. When you open the New Testament, there were some verses that Dr. Josh shared. But here's some additional ones as well. Ephesians 6, 5, bond servants. It says, obey your earthly masters. Colossians 3, 22 says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. 1 Peter 2, 18, servants, be subject to your masters. So again, just, just kind of a cursory look at the particular directives, case laws that are given, case laws in the Old Testament, directives given in the New Testament. It seems to be pretty clear that the Bible does, in fact, condone slavery. However, I want to push this conclusion a little bit, because like any subject in the Bible, we need to be sure to interpret these, these specific passages in light of the grand story or the meta narrative of the Bible. Since the Bible is telling an overarching story, not just a you know, hodgepodge of different stories, we need to be intentional about not isolating any text or topic without making sense of it in the context of the storyline or the big picture. If you don't do this type of analysis, then we end up missing the forest for the trees and drawing faulty conclusions. In order to frame my argument, I want to build off of something that Dr. Bowen communicated brilliantly in his book, Did the Old Testament Condone Slavery? In chapter one, Dr. Bowen lays out that in order to assess the subject of slavery in the Hebrew Bible accurately, we need to make sure to have all the data points in front of us. He carefully notes that all the data points that we have in the Hebrew Bible concerning slavery fall into four biblical genres. You have the legal passages, you have narrative passages, prophetic passages, and the didactic passages. After neatly laying out these categories, he warns about isolating any of those passages and drawing hard conclusions that fall short of all the data. And he, he gives this quote in his book. We also have references to practices concerning slavery in the various narration, narratives in the Old Testament, but these require a more nuanced approach as they may not reflect the ideals of the law, but simply their application or lack thereof. For example, in Nehemiah 5, we see that the Jews were selling other Jews into slavery in a way that was contrary to the law. Thus, this can tell us about how slavery was practiced, at least in this context. But it doesn't necessarily tell us what the ideal was according to the law. Now, my highlighting here is, is my, I'm emphasizing that, that's not Dr. Bowen in his book. Dr. Bowen not only identified where we find the data points, he makes sure that we weigh these data points appropriately. Now, this is exactly the concern that we have it, when it comes to the approach to this topic, that we would weigh all the data points appropriately, and it actually forms the basis of our argument. So Dr. Bowen's argument in, in a concise fashion weighs the narrative passages against the legal passages to come to a proper conclusion about what the I ideal is. Now, I think this is a great step in the right direction, but I don't think it actually goes far enough. Our arguments weigh all the passages concerning slavery, including the legal passages against the ideals presented by the grand narrative of the Bible. I'll be sure to try to click these ahead. Sometimes I forget to change the slides. 
So a couple of questions that can kind of get us at the heart of our argumentation. Does the storyline of the Bible present slavery as overall positive or negative? Now, our conclusion is, is that it's presented as actually something that's negative. Does the does the Bible present slavery as the ideal commission f- or condition for humanity? I think the answer, again, is clearly no. So when we focus on the letter of the legal text regarding slavery and then draw conclusions that God condones slavery, I think we make two fundamental errors. Number one, we fall short of the ultimate intention of the law, or you could say the spirit of the law. In Matthew 22, verse 36, Jesus summarizes the law. Somebody asked him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment uh, in the law? And he says, you'll love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and that you should love your, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he makes the statement. He says, on these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. So whatever we find by way of directive or laws or even the case laws, they're all they all should be subsumed under these two great directives. Now, I'm just going to be honest, and I'm sure we've all struggled with this. Some of these laws in the Old Testament, arguably all the slavery laws, seem to fall short of this ideal. Like, for instance, if I, in one breath, if I told you to love your neighbor as yourself, and then out of that same breath say, hey, when you buy a Hebrew slave, and so on and so forth, you might be like, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. They don't, they don't seem to be compatible ideas. Um, in the psychological literature, you might call this cognitive dissonance. It doesn't seem to be very compatible. What we need to note is that the letter of the law sometimes, or excuse me, sometimes is merely restraining evil and keeping people from moving forward or further away from what is the ideal. So it's restraining evil and making sure that they're, they're not going further from the ideal, but rather hindering them from that direction and trying to pull them back the right way. So therefore, the letter doesn't always reflect the full intention of God's plan for humanity. Now, this is a a case study. I know Dr. Bowen mentioned this. We might discuss it further. But when Jesus raises the law concerning divorce, this is a great example. Now, just to, to kind of push Dr. Bowen, Jesus doesn't actually correct the law here and say, oh, that law should have never been given. Divorce is just that bad. Obviously, he he does correct their notion of the law, but the law is holy. He's not correcting the law here. But what he's trying to get at is the intent of what that law was given for. And if you notice, let me read the text on the divorce. After Jesus was asked the question, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certification of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now notice the Pharisees were straining on the letter of the law while missing God's great intention for the special relationship. Jesus said, this law doesn't communicate the ideal, but was given because of the hardness of heart. It would be a mistake then to say that this divorce law means that God condones divorce. Regulation doesn't equal endorsement. And that's the same basic argument that we're we're bringing to the table here. The regulation of slavery doesn't equal endorsement. Now, it's interesting enough that Jesus points to the creation narrative to reorient the listener to what the ideal is, which leads me to this fundamental second error here we have. If we conclude that the legal code is actually endorsing slavery as the ideal for humanity, this is the way forward. We're falling short of God's purpose, purposes for humanity revealed in creation and redemption. Just a note on creation. You look at the creation narrative, it communicates the Imago Dei that all human beings are created equal in the image of God. The creation mandate communicates go and subdue the earth. Notice, not each other. Clearly, slavery was not in view. The phenomenon of slavery came about through the brokenness 
and fallenness of man. When we move progressively from creation to redemption, we gain additional insight into God's mind for humanity. Creation reveals God's original intent for the human race, whereas redemption reveals God's ultimate trajectory for the human race. Redemption is a major thread, no doubt, through the Hebrew Bible. In Genesis 3, you have the promise of of this coming redeemer. But redemption language really began to take shape in Exodus when God redeemed his people from the tyranny of Egypt. Before giving the terms of the covenant in the Decalogue, the Lord said in Exodus 21, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, this motif um, brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's said in different ways, but this motif appears nearly a hundred times in the Hebrew Bible and is a major way of communicating their identity as the people of God and is the basis for a continued developed ethic moving towards the ideal, loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbor as yourself. Like Dr. Bowen, you point this out in your book that there is a evolution or a development of the law from the three sections of the law given throughout Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Like for instance, in Exodus 20, you have this motif followed by case laws in Exodus 21, and you have the instruction that slaves should be released every, every six years but there's no provision for that slave upon being released. They just go free. You go to Deuteronomy 15, and they're not just instructed to release the slaves, but to send them out with abundance. And, and you make them the note, this is um, maybe a contradiction or an advancement of some sort. But notice Deuteronomy 15, 14, it says, as the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him, that is the slave, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. So there's that same motif. Hey, I'm trying to encourage your development of the ultimate ethic and it's sequential and it's slow. I mean, you think about God's redemptive plan, Genesis 3, he gives the promise of a redeemer, but it's not thousands of years later until the Messiah comes. So God doesn't come to these people and say, hey, um, Become the ideal human and I'll be your God. No, he, he actually, out of his grace, saves these people and there's a mess. And of course, in the ancient Near East and in the Torah, um, slavery was the norm for sure. But what I want to point out is that the regulation of slavery is not the end. They're pushing toward and you see an improvement of even the regulations of slavery in the, the scriptures, the Torah. Now, this ties us to Leviticus 25, because I want to point out the year of Jubilee, because the year of Jubilee is designed to be a picture of the ideal. It's like a identic reset. And I use the word identic on purpose, because surely the language is designed to tie them back to Eden, back to the Sabbath, back to the way it's supposed to be. And there's the releasing of slaves. This is the ideal. You go into the New Testament and you find this same language being picked up by Jesus. When Jesus goes into the temple, he picks up the Isaiah scroll. He reads Luke 4, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive and recover of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those that are oppressed to proclaim the year of of our Lord's favor. Now, this clear uh, clearly is a reference to the year of Jubilee, and Jesus goes on to say that he is the fulfillment of it. Now, I just want to, I only got a few seconds here to to tie this up, but as you go through the New Testament, Jesus obviously fulfilled the year of Jubilee, and on the cross, he actually was sold for the price of a slave. He took our debt on the cross, and he freed us from slavery. So the the new motif for the New Testament believer is this freedom in Christ, Galatians 5, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. Galatians 3.25, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is uh, there's no male or female for you are all one in Christ. Just to note that you said that this doesn't actually remove the social structures. I agree with that notion. This is a spiritual statement. However, the implications are there to actually change the social structure in time, which that's exactly what the church did in time, which I'm time. sure will be a fun discussion. I have one more chart I'm going to share, but I can share that in our 
um, discussion, maybe we could bring up the flea market. I, I would say go ahead. I have yeah, no we, problem we, with you yeah, finishing. Yeah, it's absolutely Are you fine. Guys, okay. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Feeling the love. Feeling the love. <laughs> so, um, so just a couple other references, like, for instance, in Peter, he says in 1 Peter 2.16, um, he's talking in the context, he's talking about a, a bunch of different ways to submit, sim slaves submitting to masters, us also submitting to government authority and such. And um, he tells the slaves to to live, basically live out the gospel and be peaceable. Um, but yet he gives this statement. He says, live, live as people who are free, 1 Peter 2.16. So there's this tying back to an identity that says, hey, we're free. And also what begins to be working out in the church is that, hey, we shouldn't be oppressing our brothers. And I think that's what Galatians 3.28 is really trying to get at as well. So in the New Testament, there's a whole letter, uh, and you mentioned this, and I, I would love to talk more about this, a whole letter written from an apostle to a slave owner, Philemon, about his runaway slave, Onesimus. Though this letter does not come out and say slavery should be abolished, I agree with that notion, it does show how the logic of the gospel is compatible, or excuse me, not compatible with the institution of slavery. Paul explicitly told Philemon to receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a dear brother. That's a pretty clear directive that I think that I would like to bring um, up in our discussion later. So in short, let me let me see if I can tie this up. This grid might help people, th those that are watching. So when these law codes were given, these, per these particular, whether they're directives or laws in the Old Testament, the original culture would look at those as an improvement upon what they were facing, particularly Israel out of Egypt. Now, I know the ancient Near East cultures there are some borrowing of laws, which we're, I'm sure will flesh out, but there certainly are some improvements as well. And so they would say, hey, this is an improvement upon how we treat human beings. So they looked at it as redemptive. Um, however, our culture, when they look back on these passages and kind of rightly so, they would say, well, this is kind of regressing. Why would I want to believe this? This seems outdated. The God of the Bible seems terrible because look what he's He's condoning, but what they're actually missing is that these regulations are not God's full intention. They are to restrain certain things, certain cases, certain activities. Um, yet the full end of the law, as is expressed, and this is not just Jesus saying this, this is Judaism would accept this as, as a whole as well. All the law hangs on loving God and loving your neighbors yourself. That is the ultimate ethic. And that's what the Bible's pressing towards. So these isolated passages, these case laws, are designed to move them forward, but they're not quite there yet. And it's not until the new covenant that we actually find more of this coming to fruition. But God is slowly maturing and moving these people towards the ultimate ideal ethic. So just a case study, and this is the last thing I'll show. Um, original culture, slavery is culturally accepted as normal and is encouraged. The Bible Slavery is regulated similarly, similarly to ancient years culture, yet with improved conditions and an underlying redemptive story. There's some passages that we, I, we can share later. Our culture looks at slavery and views it immoral and for the most and is for the most part eliminated, at least in, in our Western culture. But the ideal ethic presented in the Bible, a gospel shaped community in which slavery, along with all forms of social oppression, is eliminated. And I show Galatians 3, there's many verses that I could share. So in a closing, I would say that the Bible does not condone slavery. It actually regulates slavery with planned obsolescence that the gospel would ultimately work out. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, gentlemen, I am going to start an hour timer and then um, you guys are going to fight to the death over the next 60 yes. minutes. And uh, <laughs> um, and then I'll be popping in for a closing. And um, let me get my hour here set up on my stopwatch or timer. And um, yeah, so I'll come in. We'll do our closings five minutes each. 
Um, if you guys want to allow Josh and them a minute extra or whatever, if they need it, you know, you can, um, since we're being brotherly love here. Um, and then we'll do Q and a, so feel free to super chat your questions. Now I'm going to be doing them in order from top to bottom. So the sooner you put your questions in, I'll be addressing those as we get to the end of this. And, uh, with that being said, let me get off the screen. Once I get off the screen, time starts. And then however you want to begin, I think it's good to have Dr. Josh and Kip start responding and then you can go back and forth. All right. Okay. Good. I feel yeah. like I should apologize at the outset that uh, you're not just going to be battling me and Josh. You're going to be battling my incredibly runny nose. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm still fighting a, <clears throat> fighting a cold here that I have all week. So, um, uh, I guess I would start here with um, with a question. Uh, so, I mean, I I think as the question of the debate is laid out, does the Bible condone slavery? Um. Right at the outset, I wonder um, where the, uh, what did you call them? The, uh, on the, on the last or second last slide of your, yep. uh, of your presentation. I would suggest that uh, you've got uh, ancient Near Eastern culture on the one side, you've got Bible. And then you've got um, what was it at the uh, at the end there? Do you want me to try to pull it back up? Yeah, maybe just pull that back up for a sec. Yeah, so you can see it. Oh, you know what? Unless Derek yeah, just... fell asleep, it's possible. Oh, oh, oh no, maybe we can't. Can you just read it, like at the bottom of the? Yeah, slide? yeah, sure. So, um, so you had the original culture. And that represented yeah. ancient years culture or Greco and Roman culture as well. Then you had the Bible yeah. and yeah. particularly talking about these isolated commands or directives. So kind of that ethic frozen in time idea. Then you have our culture looking back on that ethic frozen in time saying, wow, that's right. really behind. But missing out on the storyline actually developing to to actually show forth the ultimate or ideal ethic, which is not like a New Testament, just to clarify, it's not like a New Testament idea that's just kind of forced back on to the text, you know, uh, but more of, I mean, these are loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbor yourself. These are obviously with embed, embedded in the Torah as well. So that would just right. to clarify that. But Jesus also does define who his neighbor, who your neighbor is, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, there's definitely an advancement and a further working out of. Does it include slaves? Oh, you mean, does he apply to slaves? No. No. But Not obviously, specifically. but if, if, is so the how do you get there? Laws, if the slavery laws, are they actually laws of the Bible? Yes. And if all law hangs on these two commands, then it would apply to anything that you would find in the law. So to answer the question, uh, Dr. Kip, it, it, it does, Jesus yep. didn't explicitly say slaves in his paragraph there, but it would apply to slaves. Yes. To answer like, just so that there's clarity there. He didn't explicitly I'm not say convinced. your neighbor's a slave. So I'm not, I'm not convinced of that. And the reason I'm not convinced of that is because of uh, the amount of effort that Josh and I uh, put into ensuring that we have this, uh, this distinction in uh in the social understanding of of how people interact and where their their role and their function is within within the cosmos um we have a tendency to to read back into this ancient near eastern culture ideals about love freedom um and humanity that are not necessarily um, entrenched within the uh, cultures which produced the Bible. And I would include 
uh, the New Testament. And, uh, oh, sure. And I would totally agree with that. Destruction about that, too. So I guess, I mean, I have a I have a problem at the outset with expanding that definition beyond what Jesus says explicitly. And I also have a question about who decides what the meta narrative is. Well, in, in my mind, it's pretty self-evident. Would you come up with a different meta narrative, or would you say, of course, postmodern would say there are no meta narratives? You know, <laughs> we could go that direction. That'd be kind of fun. But, um, <laughs> but would you say that the that the Bible actually is telling a story? If I could turn the question. No, I so. I would I would say that you can read it that way and that is certainly how the uh, the individual texts have been organized and we see the organization change and shift um, sure. with regards to how we want that story to be told but it's not self-evident and then I guess on top of that, maybe something else that uh, that I wonder about is does the context of your meta narrative trump the original context, and why, and then how? Yeah, that's a well great that. Ahead, yeah, great question. Uh, the meta narrative was set not by one single passage or just hinging on Jesus. I mean, beginning at the be at uh, where John presented, going back to Genesis, from the very beginning of creation to fall, the instantaneous promise of redemption, these individuals to sacrificing and atoning and and laws to redeem, redemption laws, atonement laws, going into looking for a Messiah, they into the prophets. A constant narrative is always that God would redeem that which was broken, bring them back to Eden, uh, that terminology. Isaiah just relished the idea of Edenic. He even uses terminology that would take their minds with certain trees and, and certain statements that would bring them back to the fall and then creation. So the, the entirety, I would say, of the Torah itself points to this meta narrative individually. Like if you were just to take the first five, there is the ultimate goal to bring everything back to that restored Eden um, by also dealing with people, it, by giving redemption in the sense of saving people out of slavery to begin with, which would have been Israel. And then you go into the sections about the prophets. The prophets are longing and prophesying of this one to come that would take away their oppression, take away their struggle, take away their agony, take away their adversaries and redeem us. So even in the section of the prophets from the minor prophets, the 12 or going into the heartbeat of Isaiah, redemption is at the forefront of even the prophets or restored back to a state of correctness and rightness and justice. And then redemption you for whom? Well, particularly when you get into the prophets, they start expanding that God was actually going back to Isaiah, particularly going back to the Abrahamic covenant, uh, which God dealt with a man out of the land of us, I mean, in the Earl, the Chaldee is going into that promise with him that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, which insulted the Jews that the prophets would turn this promise of blessing beyond the borders of Israel, because now he's saying, I'm going to create a covenant that expands beyond you. I'm going to call people that are not called by my name. This would have been an insult. And by the time Jesus gets on the scene, they were outraged that Jesus should start bringing parables in about Samaritans and befriending them and allowing them to be the good guy in his parable instead of the bad guy. Jesus opens this door that my kingdom is bigger than you and that you're actually And Jesus even said, many of you are going to come into the entrance of the kingdom from, from your location of Israel. And you're going to see that there are people from the East and the West the North and the South that are reclining at a table with the patriarchs and the prophets, and you're going to be kicked out. I mean, that's not popular teaching. That's why the Jews turned on him. So actually the purpose that the prophets and Jesus points us back to is that the Jews made 
their promises all about them when actually Isaiah says, you are meant to be a light to the nations and you've hidden yourself from them. You've mistreated them. You've thought wrongly about them. So I think that a lot of the prophets are spending their time correcting this system of thinking that Israel's it and no more. When actually it was teaching from the very beginning of Genesis 15, the Abrahamic covenant, through one man, God would bless all the nations. But at no point does that include slaves. Oh, certainly. Because Within the text, if we're talking about the text here of the Bible, there is no provision um, for the total emancipation of slaves. Oh, well, yeah. That... So, so ahead, like, I, Sorry, just, a, and if, just a comment on if that. If that's so... what this debate is about, if this debate is about the text and not just, if this debate is about the text of the Bible and not your hermeneutic applied to the text, in an effort to see it as a grand narrative, then we should be well, talking say, about though, what's in the text. Sure. But I would say the majority of scholarship would identify that there is a narrative, a, a meta narrative. I don't actually know too many scholars, even um, those who would be, you know, just if you want to say liberal scholars, I don't really like that term, but you know what I mean. Um, what I mean is they're not evangelical. You know, so a broader level of scholarship that would say that there is actually a storyline. Um, I don't think that that is argued as much. Um, now you're saying, how does the meta narrative affect slavery in those particular texts? I think when you read those particular texts and that's all that you had, I think that you guys have a great point. It's like, well, he said, this is how when you go to buy a Hebrew slave, this is what you do. This is the laws this is how you regulate it. I think you have a good point, but that's, but, and I think the difference is we see a continuity of the Bible, whereas you would see it as a little bit more of a discontinuity as approach. So in other words, we need to stay in the particular passages as opposed to trying to see this as a, as a overarching story. And I think that's where we're fundamentally disagreeing. Would that be correct? Yeah. So let me, if I could, just for a second, sorry, Kip. Um, no, so I, I, I don't think, <clears throat> so there are a couple of things. I took some, some notes here. Um, but just to speak specifically to that point, I don't think that's necessarily the case that we're, you know, uh, saying that we have to remain in isolated passages or something and we can't look to an overarching construction i think the question is or the pushback is um if you're going to apply something like a matthew 19 sort of interpretation and apply it then to slavery you've got to justify that right and i think in order to justify that you would have to you would have to show i think um that the new testament authors are moving that direction Right. Or have made. So, so in other words, if we're looking at divorce as the example, if Jesus is coming up with this new teaching and I'm not a New Testament scholar, you know, so New Testament, early church, not I'm me. Also not a New Testament. Yeah. Scholar. Um, <clears throat> but but if if you're if you're arguing that and you're looking at what what he says about divorce and you're then trying to make that connection to slavery, I think you have to show that. In, well, it, with respect to slavery. And when you have passages like Luke 17, or you have the early church, not really, uh, certainly what until like the fourth century, not picking up on this, um, I think it, it creates a problem um, saying that this is, this is something that uh, was intended in the New Testament, um, if that makes sense. Well, if I could insert on there, uh, Dr. Josh, when we're talking about the idea of divorce, it's it's not about that as much as the concept that Jesus was was making there is these guys were so stuck on the letter of the law that they missed the original purpose. And, and that's the example. And, and the way to prove that for slavery and marriage was the statement Jesus made. He took us back to actually Torah in Genesis and said, from the beginning, this was not God's design. Divorce was not a part of God's design. This was something permitted by Moses as a way to regulate sin within relationships that cause unreconcilable differences. 
what we're saying is, is it's like, well, that's not equal. But what we're saying is, is that that slavery in the same way to deal with human to human, you go back to the original narrative. What was God's intention for humanity in the Imago Dei? The image bearing. He told them to subdue the earth and the animals, not humans. So in the original design of God, it was never intended in creation in Torah to put humans under subject to other humans. That was not a part of the original design, no more than was God to separate a marriage a part of the original design. We're not, we're not looking at Matthew 19 and 22 and, and, and saying like, oh, well, Jesus' interpretation is how we're reading that into the Old Testament. We're saying that his thought process is a good one. Well, you guys are focusing on the law, but is there a bigger picture here than just the letter of the law? Was there actually an original intent of God behind these laws? And he takes them further than Exodus and Deuteronomy specifically there. And he goes back to the original design. And we're saying that in the original design, God never intended for humans to subdue humans. They were to subdue animals in the earth. Would, would you agree with that, Dr. Josh? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly so about... We're making use of the hermeneutic. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yes. I, th I, think, I think the struggle is that um, this doesn't seem to play out and again, not my area of expertise, but it doesn't seem to play out in the rest of the New Testament. It doesn't seem like the early church picked up on it. Well, the early church certainly so, struggled with the idea of slavery, and and uh, Augustine really picked this this up um, in Hippo. Um, but going back, before we get to the church history part, can we back up to maybe Philemon? Because I know that you mentioned, we can at least both mention that in presentations. Uh, so, Paul's understanding. Um, I don't remember which aspect, Dr. Josh, in your notes, you mentioned uh, Philemon there from the perspective that basically that there was no abolishment commanded. It, it, did I understand that right? Yeah, I'll read the quote. And again, yeah. yeah, when it when it comes to things like um, things in the New Testament like this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be um, looking to sort of consensus positions on this. Sure, because uh, it's it's not my area of expertise. Um, how do I open up a document? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It, it is. It's I can't do two things <laughs> at do. once. Right? I think it's the word "open." I don't remember. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I I, I I lose so many files when I'm in the middle of a debate. It happens. It really does. So uh, this was in the state or in the opening. I had uh, Loza in his uh, commentary on Philemon. He wrote. For good reasons, this view, the view that um, it's an overarching declaration on the institution of slavery, for good reasons, this view has found no acceptance and today is no longer held by anyone. The letter to Philemon is neither the disguise of a general idea nor the promulgation of a generally valid rule about the question of slavery. Gotcha. So I, I'm always um, a little skeptical. I try not to do it as well. It's easy to do sometimes. Like it's like, well, the consensus of scholarship says, you know, it's easy to throw that out there. I think I could find other people that actually do lean more towards, but I don't, I don't know of anybody that says that Philemon presents some type of abol abolition, you know, right. let's abolish slavery. I don't know of anybody that would go that direction. My point, and I'm curious of your thoughts here, Josh. I do want to get to Exodus 21, though. I want to get to the actual law codes here. But uh, the um, yeah, that'd be great. The, when when it comes to <laughs> we're trying to answer the, your question the long way. Sorry, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the logic when it comes to the the, the gospel, he's obviously um, bearing down on this relationship with the gospel in mind. And I know you talked about the potential of him profiting from this, you know, this guy coming with serving with him in the ministry. I think that's a potential motive as well. But I, I feel like in the text, if you at face value, he is really trying to work out the gospel and how um, Philemon thinks about his his property, the slave, and being able to say, hey, treat him as a brother, not as a slave. I feel like that is a big change. Wouldn't you say that's a change from the Old Testament? Maybe not to abolish slavery but at least a change of mood and working out and I, the gospel you you go ahead josh and i might be completely wrong about this because i i probably know even less about the new testament than josh does um <laughs> which is sad but as i it's it's very sad because i don't know much <laughs> as 
as I understand it, um, I would say it, it, pr- no. What I would say is happening in Philemon is is an expansion of the definition of what precisely is the Bene Israel. Uh, as I as I understand it, the church was an extension. Early Christianity was an extension of this ideal that there was a special covenant people of God. Um, now, in the Old Testament, that was restricted by blood to you know whoever or however they determined belonged to the community. In the New Testament, the application of that is, you know, it's no longer blood, it's under the covenant of Christ. So what I see going on here is a, is Paul saying Onesimus, no, Philemon is, is the guy and Onesimus is the slave, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So he's saying Philemon, Onesimus is part of this community. And as part of this community, he is now Enoch. He is a brother. Sorry, we also son, isn't it? Sorry, he's an Adelphos. He is a brother in exactly the same fashion that the Torah uh, instructed that you were to provide special treatment to your brothers that was totally distinct from how you treated those who were not part of the community. Am I wrong here? Well, the, the only reason I'd, I'd give pushback particularly on that, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with everything you just said, um, actually. But the the thing is with Philemon and Onesimus, they're in the city of Colossae, and they would have had no idea in some of that integrated stuff that was in Israel. These are Gentiles. Um, they wouldn't have had an appreciation or in their in their Gentile mind think, we need to align ourselves with Jewish custom I think what Paul was doing there was actually pulling them away from you need to look at because he said so in Galatians, whether you're a master or a slave or a male or a female, you are equal in Christ. Like you're you you are not better than anybody. And so in that's the community. Where, right. No, well, no, because Paul actually talks about how to treat outsiders that are outside of the community, too. And he actually tells them to give an extra amount of grace and an extra amount of patience and an extra amount of forgiveness that you would give with even in the unchristian communities. Paul the trying same to... is the same is the same elimination of the social structure to extend beyond the community, though. Well, their goal was to to reach every social structure and to bring like Paul was trying to bring things for women. He was trying to bring things for slaves. He's trying to bring things in for Jew and Gentile. Like he's trying to get churches to stop looking at ethnicity and stop looking at um, ethnic backgrounds, languages, all of that, because he's trying to bring them to the fact that you are all the same. You're image bearers of God. And in that, Christ came to redeem image bearers. That's not based on a language. That's not based on a skin tone. That's not based on a social status. He's bringing them all to the same equality, which at that point was a new concept for a lot of these people, not just in the Jewish realm, but even in the Greco-Roman realm, especially in Colossae, where they're going to be heavily influenced by how the Romans did things. So I think he's trying to, he's trying to bring Jews and Gentiles from different ethnic backgrounds, social statuses and belief systems being monotheism and polytheism and bringing them together to understand that who they are is not based on any of those things. And I actually see him trying to bring unity around any diversity. He's, he's really trying to champion this in many of his letters, especially when he's dealing with this situation with Philemon. I, I just don't think, I just don't think that's self-evident from the text. I mean, that's well, a, that's an ideal that's part says, of though, the hermeneutic. He, he does say receive that, him no longer as a slave. Yeah. He told him to drop the slave. Status. But why? Why? Well, because exactly. he wants, yeah, exactly. Cause he's because, in the, he's in the community now. What's well, not just about the community, it's what the community is doing for society too, because the that's, slavery so issue that's, is, but the slavery issue is a societal issue, not a Christian community issue. And what and what Paul just did is give Philemon an opportunity to apply their beliefs 
on a man who cost him apparently a lot of money enough where Paul said, I'll pay his debt for you. Uh, like he's trying to get Philemon without him forcing him to do it. Cause he said, I can command you to do this, but I'm not going to do this. I want you to do it. Cause you want to do it. He was trying to get Philemon to see your perspective as a slave owner needs to change, not just simply on the community aspect, but because what the gospel is doing for Philemon, not Onesimus, although in Paul's mind, he's celebrating both. He's opening this door for Philemon to act like a gospel community person because this is something he needed to grow in and understand differently. That's that's what Paul is actually trying to do for Philemon is encourage yeah. him to see the freedom in Christ. Can I ask that question for Dr. Josh? Or did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> so I, I, I kind of wanted to, to, to take a step back and maybe go back because there's, I think there's a big sort of elephant in the room here that I think is a, is okay. a problem. But I wanted to say this, let's assume for a second um, that this is the case. It seems like the best case scenario that we're looking at here um, is that there, uh, God, God is working so subtly to make this improvement that it leaves Paul saying uh, nothing outright about it, um, and and sort of hinting at it, and you know, as you said, letting letting Philemon sort of you know work it out on his own, or uh, you know, make that decision on his own. Um, Can I and clarify that, that point? That point right there. Uh, I, I don't think sure, it's subtle. Sure. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. I'll let you finish. No, no. I was just going to say that. Um, <laughs> It seems like this is this is a directive that doesn't come, right? Um, so and, I agree with that assessment. I'm so excited. I need to stop talking. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're people. good. I, so and and so, but what I do want to do is is because I, I'm I'm trying to take it back to the to the Hebrew Bible. Well, we'll go back there. Yeah. Just to clarify, we think there is an explicit statement: no longer a slave is explicit. Don't view, he's not a slave to you anymore. That's their directive. We would argue for it's not, it's not or biased. More, you, why do you more well, re receive him no longer as a slave, but as a dear brother, they're still not, may not be like totally breaking that relationship, at least in a spiritual sense. I want to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. 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 But I do, um, I, if I just put it this way, we can move back is just, I feel like there's enough here of like in Christ, there is no more of these distinctions. And then he's saying, hey, don't treat him as a slave, treat him as a brother. Like I'm just, if you yeah. pick a couple of these statements together, I feel like it's a little bit more forceful than like how you're describing it, at least a few minutes ago. I feel like it's a and, little bit and, more of a punch, but we'll it be... doesn't ever get around. Old Testament, New Testament does not ever give a command that abolishes slavery. And, and we'll admit oh, I do agree church, with that point. And we'll admit that the church as a whole did did a bad job with with this in history, and that they actually failed to act quicker than they did. Um, you know, I know you want to get to the Old Testament, but we do see this start happening. Augustine really had his eyes open to this um, in Hippo. This is something that became a big deal to him after a while. And so the, we admit, like, oh, like, we're not saying like we're trying to defend, well, church history got it right all the time. Well, no, no, they didn't. And people wrongly use these passages to defend slavery. Um, and so we're, we're not here to defend the church in every Well, let's, light. let's, yeah, so let's talk about that. And before we actually get to the Hebrew Bible, there's this, the, on your two slides that you put up, that, that, uh, are they from William Webb's book? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. Um, so, uh, th there's this sort of critical part and there's, a, there's another guy, Ganuza, I think that wrote something in 2016. And mine's maybe. actually a little bit different than William Webb. I made some additions or some okay. changes, but it's a basic same flow. But there's this, there's this underlying idea that I saw in the slides and that I heard or that I read, you know, Ganuza say, and that is that there's like this, this improvement in the Hebrew Bible, uh, moving like moving more progressively out of the ancient Near Eastern law collections. Um, and I, I take a lot of issue with that. Um, and 
it sort of it sort of came out um, when you guys were when you guys were talking in your opening in particular. Uh, this idea of like, or maybe it wasn't in the opening, I don't remember, but this idea of like don't oppress and to love and the sort of aspects of social justice. This is something that's exceptionally common in ancient Near Eastern, not just in the law collections, but in royal inscriptions. I mean, the rulers, this is what they did, right? As they were all about, uh, you can read the the, the laws of Ornama or the laws of uh, Hammurabi, as everybody does, read the, the prologues. And I mean, you'll see that his his primary function uh, is to be this social justice warrior, right? He's, he's making sure that the rich don't oppress the weak. I mean, the, the poor and that the strong don't oppress the weak and, that, and they declare yeah. this, this freedom of debt slavery. And, and so I, I, I think that, I, th- I think I would wanna maybe delve into a little bit, uh, not just your individual uh, under, uh, understandings of the individual passages, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, but maybe as we go through that, like where it is that you think there are these like great advancements. Okay. So mm. let's take a left turn then before we get back to Exodus, let's stop in Jeremiah. Uh, so at least we're back in the old Testament. Now we we've, we've made a left turn at least. Um, I see uh, two passages, particularly uh, Dr. Josh, where I would make that uh, advancement where God actually seems to become actually stricter on his people for not having practiced the law better. Um, Particularly in in Jeremiah 34 uh, verses 10 and following, you have these individuals that practiced Jubilee. They released these slaves, male and female slaves were released on Jubilee. Then he indicates that they took them right back into slavery, but the term he uses is different. So it it, it indicates to me that they went from termed slave to chattel slaves because he says they did it against their will. Whereas if they were in a qualified Jubilee situation, they chose to be in that. And then God has a massive blow up at his people for this. I mean, he, he lays it down for him. He said, you've embarrassed me in front of the kingdoms of the earth because they literally took slaves that were chosen slaves, bond servants, went through the process, freed on Jubilee. And because they took advantage of their still poorness, they forced them back into what seems to be chattel slavery. And God is livid. He's so livid that he tells them, because you've done this, you've made me profane. You've profaned my name amongst the nations. So I'm in, we're going to turn, I'm going to bring pestilence, famine, and sword against you. Now, because they've taken the the heart, this is where John and I are saying the heartbeat, the the the, the meta narrative is there again. What is it? God's trying to God created man not to subdue each other, but to actually coexist and subdue the earth. And here was an opportunity for them to celebrate because God actually kind of celebrates their moment of following the covenant by saying, "You followed Jubilee. You've released these people. This is great." And then you turn right around and abused what I was trying to do. It's like he was telling them, you missed the heart of the law of slavery. My goal is to free people, not to put them into slavery. And you put them into not just slavery, but chattel slavery. And he says, as a result, I'm coming after you, my people, Jews. I'm going to bring pestilence, famine, and sword, which was Babylon. And I'm taking you down. That doesn't sound like a God to me that's endorsing slavery. Yeah, so let's yes, pretty angry about this. Oh, and then the second one's Nehemiah, where they actually stop. So this is 200 years after Jeremiah. They stopped practicing Jubilee and he comes after them and they read the law and they they like, okay, all right, we got to like start start doing this. God actually becomes stricter on their not celebrating Jubilee moments or looking at freedom for people. But go ahead. Go ahead, Kip, if you want to. You seem no, like you want. I just, I mean, I mean, I the, the, one of my fears here, and one of the things that I, I, I really want to emphasize that we tried to emphasize in our opening is that you're using people here as if it applies to everyone. It does not. Yeah. There well, is no provision. Jeremiah, Jeremiah does not care about the Edomite slaves in Jerusalem. He does not. This is a provision. The whole concept of Jubilee 
is about ensuring that the Ahuzah, that is the, the inherited property that Yahweh uh, gave to the nation of Israel. It's about ensuring that everybody still gets their part. And at no point does anybody outside of the Bnei Yisrael have any part in the Yahuzah. So what Jeremiah so there's is no, talking There's no about law here, related to foreigners? Not, not, uh, when not, in, not in this sense, no. Can, can, can I... Uh, well, go ahead and finish. I'll, go, go ahead. I'm go ahead. So yeah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah is ex, is explicit here about enslaving Hebrews, enslaving people who are part of the covenant. This is you can't do this with the Bene Israel. Okay, um, I I would actually push back a little bit on that. I would actually say that there are actually cases, including in Leviticus, where jubilee does apply to an outsider, not only from the purpose of a slave, but a slave owner. In Leviticus chapter 25, and I know Josh has his passage stop up, I think at verse 46. But if you read right after that section in verse 47, if a sojourner or a stranger close to you becomes rich and one of your brothers, Jewish, who dwells by him becomes poor, sells himself to the stranger, sojourner close to you or a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. Here's a, a proselyte. This is a, this is a Gentile who has submitted themselves under the Jewish law codes and has made themselves a part of the Jewish faith. This is a Gentile. They own land. They've become rich yeah, on the Jewish lands. That, that's, that's and they bought, that's, that's exactly wrong. what the text it's, says. It's definitely, it's it's definitely not. A sojourner or a stranger no. becomes rich and owns at a no Jewish point, land. Yeah, it's definitely at not. At no point do these people become part of the Bnei Yisrael. They hold are on, not hold, regarded hold part on. of the community. And, and they've acknowledged Jubilee because if you read in the passage there, it even says when the uncle or the uh, the nephew cannot redeem that person and the man, the slave actually becomes rich himself, which means slaves could actually become wealthy enough That's, to buy their yeah. freedom. Yeah, he has to account for the time of Jubilee. So that means this sojourner is people? applying the laws of Jubilee to his slave owning. No, it's so, which, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kip, sorry. I'm just, who, which people? The sojourner and the stranger. Who are, are in flying, slavery. They are enslaving. Who are enslaved. The 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 sojourner who is enslaved, where is his provision? No, the sojourner owns the slave in this passage. And the one yeah, I'm referring. But, but which slave is does he does this apply to you know part of the, the covenant community, the B'nai Israel, the Hebrew slaves, or does this extend to include uh the Gerim and the Toshavim? Hold on. So are you, are you I'm talking about I'm talking about the enslaved portion. Just the enslaved portion. Who is in view here that gets redeemed? The Jewish slave that's bought by the sojourner. Yes. At okay. no point does the Toshav or the Ger get redeemed. Not ever. That's right. Well, I, I would I would argue differently here because this is go. but this is where this is a person who has placed themselves as a Gentile under the law, which now applies them to Jubilee. This is why he's practicing no. Jubilee. No, it doesn't. Josh, yeah. are you saying he, I mean, if he has to here? follow the law hey, of Jubilee. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. Bit. But the law yes, of Jubilee uh, doesn't apply to him. Yeah. Let, so let's Do you understand let's, like let let let's yeah let's back this up just so that the audience knows what we're talking about. So uh, this is sort of why I went through Leviticus twenty five just in general in the opening. Um, but the the text is dealing with uh, what it what it is uh, or what takes place when an Israelite becomes poor uh, and starts to 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 fall into poverty. Um, and so. Uh, when it gets down to, they get to the point that they have to sell themselves in 39 to 43, uh, then they're not to be treated as slaves, they're to be treated as hired workers by fellow Israelites. 
Then the text deals in 44 to 46 with where are you supposed to get your slaves? And if you can't treat Israelites as slaves, where do you get them? Get them from the Toshavim. These are tenant farmers that are living in the midst. Uh, you can get them from the Goyim, the nations around you. These people are not subject, explicitly not subject to the year of Jubilee. Um, they are explicitly not subjected to it. Uh, that they, that's, that's why the text is saying they, they can be kept for life and passed on as inheritance. Israelites cannot fall under that category. But then the text says, what happens if one of those Toshavim, one of those tenant farmers, this is somebody that's living in the land, does not own land, is renting land from one of the Israelites. And in doing so, it, it's almost like the text is picturing, all right, you've got this tenant farmer, um, and the tenant farmer is renting a plot of land, however many acres or whatever, from from an Israelite because they can't own land. Right? Does it say that? Yeah, I mean that's well, that's yeah, what it, Toshavim it, are. It, it says they're renting land in that verse. Yeah, that's what Toshavim are. They can't own the land. Yeah, but they yeah. came. I. But they. Okay, go ahead. This is why Ezekiel. This is why Ezekiel is like going to great lengths later on to say, yeah, but see, this is the way that it was. But in the like in the grand scheme of things. Uh, these foreigners are going to be able to come in more, right? That's the, that's the point. Um, but the point of the Toshav here uh, is that this is a tenant farmer that's living in the land, that's renting the land out, that's uh, either taking, uh, goes into debt, um, can't make the can't make the payment to the Israelite, whatever, and falls into debt servitude. Wait, wait, hold on, who? The Jew or the sojourner? In 44 to 46, it's talking about a toshav, a tenant farmer, who becomes subjected to an Israelite, probably through debt, right? Um, but in 47, it and through what, 52, it takes up the other, the other possibility. What happens if that tenant farmer that's living in the land, what if he actually does well? Right. What if he has good crop years and he gets to, you know, really, really he, he does well financially to the point that he can take uh, Israelite debt slaves. Right. He makes loans to them and, and, and they can't pay it back and he takes them. What does the law say about that person? Right. That's the situation that's being described here. Now, all of this is probably utopian. Right. This is probably something that wasn't ever put into practice. Hi probably hypotheticals. Isn't a, a lot of these right. are hypotheticals. What sure. are scenarios? Yeah. Right. Exactly. But specifically here in Leviticus 25, I and mean, we're probably talking very utopian. But at any rate, it, it, assuming ass, assuming just the, the nature of the of uh, of the text, if it were put into practice, this is it's trying to say, well, we know. All right. Well, we know what happens if an Israelite takes another Israelite. OK, and now we know what happens if an Israelite takes a foreigner. What about if one of the Israelites gets taken by a foreigner as a slave? What do you do then? What does the, the law say? Reading this as like a, a proselyte is a later understanding of the term ger, right? That's, that's a later understanding. Yeah. Um, and I don't know of anybody that would argue uh, that that's written on Leviticus that would argue um, well, that. Th this is what, go, go ahead, John. I was just going to, I was trying to recall what Sarna wrote on this passage. I know you're pretty familiar with him on this. Does he take that interpretation? Yeah. I mean, he doesn't take anything substantially different. I don't remember what he said off the top of my head, but I, uh, I, I wish I had the note. Hang on. But Here, hold on. I do know. Um, I oh, probably got quote. Yeah, you, oh, wait. You can I, don't, I don't think I quoted it in here, did I? It's Josh. Damn it. I'm sorry. It's probably in my Just doing an obligatory <laughs> book. Plug. I really um, I appreciated Sarna and I wanted to actually bring him up because his you quoted him. But his, I guess, articulation of this is a different passage is the Exodus 21 passage. So I'm not trying to change the subject. <laughs> we no, can no, okay. I'd like to get there, but I, I don't want to jump the ship if you guys got more to say. I, I think I did the long set of quotes just in the uh, to the Old Testament endorsed slavery. So I don't I don't think it's actually in the, that chapter in the Atheist Handbook site. So Sarna's downstairs. So I wouldn't be able to. Oh, no, that's okay. Sorry. Um, no, no worries. I, I, I can't recall either. I, I just, I could look it up, I guess, but I don't know. <laughs> It'd take me a while to find it. But I mean, but, this, um, oh, sorry, John, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that um, I feel like Sarna, who's obviously a um, Jewish rabbi scholar, um, articulated this uh, in different a bit, but Maybe in, in substance, I think it's probably pretty close to what you're saying. So I don't know if it's worth straining on. So go ahead. 
It's not well, worth it. I can't remember the quote. <laughs> Just well, worth the, I, I, I don't, you're, the part about proselytizing being later, we, we see this actually not long after this, particularly with Rahab from Jericho. And then later on, we have a whole book of Ruth where these laws, not specifically this exact one, these law sets were actually applied to even her kinsman redemption through Boaz. And she was a Moabitess. So I, I don't think it's as far off the proselytizing process wasn't as far off. Again, these are a lot of hypotheticals. I'm saying about, specifically the use of the term gear. I'm That's speaking it. about the Gentiles being proselytized because you said that that was a far off thing. It wasn't I, I'm, that... I'm saying specifically the use of the term gear in 47 to 52. Right. I, I, I got what you're yeah, saying. Okay. So, but you're, but you are, but you would agree that Gentiles were starting once the Jews actually got there, like actually in the land started seeing a proselytized process. You see it with Rahab from Jericho being the first one that we have recorded within actually Joshua itself. And then obviously a whole book with Ruth during the days of the judges, which weren't far after that. I mean, yeah. there's, sorry, but, go ahead. Kip. No, I was just, I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, from our perspective, certainly this is a very idealized view of the text. Um, you know, much of this depends on where you're going to set the dates for, for these things. And, and most, most critical scholars would 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 put this stuff pretty late. I don't remember them separ separating the judges that far off in Joshua's time, that far off from the narrative of the Exodus. Well, can we uh, can I, we go yeah. to we can go to Exodus probably 21. beside the point? That's a yeah, it's a second secondary. So it's um, it, yeah, it's it's secondary. Sure. This is like I wish I wish I could have like, hey guys, can we spend a couple hours and just Exodus, and a couple hours and just do around these? <laughs> yeah, let's. Be, 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 all right, we finally well, made it in Torah. We're at Leviticus I, I, I now. Okay. We can hit Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. so in Exodus, I just wanted to ask Dr. Josh what you thought about this synopsis. If I could just uh, elaborate for a moment. So, in Exodus twenty, you have. The, this motif that God is calling. I've called you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is obviously a motif that's going to appear, I think, in every genre of the Hebrew Bible. So it's a key identifier. Then he gives, um, which I think is important to note, too, like when it comes to the law, one thing about ancient Near East law codes as opposed to the Torah, I think that's different. One of the different key components is actually the underlying story that's being told. And of course, that's natural, different cultures, different stories. But I mean, the fact that God is actually, he called them out to make a covenant rather than calling them to the covenant for them to be his people. Like he's already pulled them out. Now, these qualities, these codes were what would make up, like, this is what I want you to be. This is what, what I want you to embody. Um, but this is by God's initiation. I mean, if you go back all the way to Abrahamic covenant all the way to this point delivered out of Egypt. This is God's initiation. I think you would probably agree with that. Maybe he wants it differently, but probably agree. Um, but then he gives, um, he gives the Decalogue. Would you divide the Decalogue into um, I, the understanding that the first four commands probably are a good summary of loving God with all your heart. And then the last four of the Decalogue uh, for our six commandments or 10 words, however you want to express it. Um, would represent <laughs> loving your neighbor as yourself. Would you say that that falls? I know a lot of rabbinical teaching would separate it. I know some people separate it differently, but I've seen that being the most consistent. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm gonna just okay. Yeah, I, I I'd have to think about it. I don't know that I've thought about it in those terms before. But go go ahead. Okay. So, in my estimation, like so, he he sets out the decalogue, and the decalogue is in like if you want to kind of throw like some hermeneutics of thinking on this particular topic. The Decalogue is trans transcultural in that um, it wasn't um, for a particular just culture and it didn't continue. It obviously continued into the New Testament. All of the Ten Commandments are actually reiterated in the New Covenant people. But the case laws were actually cultural and time bound. So the Decalogue is transcultural, timeless, um, and then you have the, um, the case laws that follow that are cultural and time bound. 
And so the, my point, my point in getting at this is that Sarna actually picks up on this point that uh, the case laws actually see an evolution or a development along the way. So in other words, there's not just here's the case laws, the same laws that are never going to change because they're from God. Rather, these case laws were actually given by judges that were authorized to speak on the behalf of God. Yet they never viewed them at the same level as the Decalogue. The Decalogue was this is the very words of God, which if you bring it apart, the, the law is loving God, loving your neighbor. These laws are, you know, timeless, transcultural, like I said. And when you have Exodus 21 through 24, what you have is a really not actually a full case law like the Code of Hammurabi. I know we don't have all of them, but what is it, 282 laws? Um, and there's um, for this case law, I think there's 52, depending on who's counting. It's a little different, but about 52 case laws. Um, and they, out, of, out of all uh, laws comparing to ancient Near East law codes, the Hebrew Bible is the most disorganized. It's very when it comes to categorization. I mean, and I know there's some law codes that don't have you don't have as much. You know, you don't we don't have a full listing of it. But my point is, is that like I know the Code of Hammurabi is probably the most referenced, and I know that's your expertise as well. But that's categorized. Um, very clear, like here's all the laws on justice, here's the laws on buildings, here's the laws on slaves, here's, the, you know what I mean? But then you have in Exodus 21 through 24, you kind of have it bouncing around from here's cultish, you know, worship uh, laws, and then it goes to slavery laws, and then it's like, hey, let's jump back to worship, that's cool, and let's throw this law in here. Like, um, it's kind of, from our sensibilities, a little bit disorganized. So the case that I, I would like to, to make is that this is functioning more more than like a strict law code. Like this is a full developed law code for Israel. It's more designed to be like a compendium that would showcase here's how Israel took the Decalogue, the law of God, which if you were to summarize the Decalogue into two, loving God, loving your neighbor. This is them working that out in particular cases, in a particular scenario, obviously case law. But that's not to be viewed as this is the final word of God. This is the judge making a call in Israel in that particular community. And this makes actually a case, and this is what Tharna's conclusion is, is that this, there's a development because they're actually moving towards, he doesn't use this language, so I don't want to put words in his mouth, but um, they're moving toward the ideal of what it means to love God and love your neighbors or your heart. And so we didn't actually get to it, but Dr. Kip was saying, you got to be in the passage, you got to be in the passage, but that's exactly the point when we expand on, this is what all the law of God is designed to do. Here are people that come from a culture that, uh, slavery, as you said, was not immoral. It was normal. Every culture did it. And they began to lay out, hey, this is what it looks like to love love our neighbor. This is how we should do slavery. And I, we could, I don't know if we'll have time, but I do think that they do improve upon some of the slavery laws. When I look at the Code of Hammurabi as opposed to the Torah, I do think there's improvements. We could we could dive into that. I'm sure you'd be interested in hearing that. Yeah, I but, would. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me just say this very quickly. Um, so the nature. Sorry, no, no, no. So so the nature of that eight minutes left scared me. Um, <laughs> so the nature of ancient Near Eastern law collections, including those in the Hebrew Bible, is actually pretty complex. Um, so if you're taking the, uh, if if you're beginning with um, the idea that uh, this Mount Sinai uh, event actually took place, right? And Yahweh handed down the laws. Um, there really isn't a way that I can see that you can get around these being legislative, right? Because these, these are the laws that are stated in the text as coming from Yahweh. Um, now, the reason that this gets sort of muddled is because like from critical or seriological or whatever, uh, uh, scholarship, like we know, no is the wrong word. We're reasonably sure 
that things like the laws of Ornamu, the laws of Lepidishtar, the laws of Eshnun, the laws of Hammurabi, all the, the, these, those four in particular, they're not normative legislation. They weren't something that the judges sat back and referred to or something. These are end up being, well, what they are is debated, hotly debated. But um, so when you look at w what, you know, comes and, and they're, they're terribly disorganized themselves. Uh, I, I think Hammurabi has longer stretches sometimes, but even in and of itself, we would look at its organization. If you read through it and you'd be like, what the hell? Um, certainly <laughs> well, like there the are, laws. Yeah, like some, some laws related to slavery that are in different sections. Yeah, yeah. And, you see them, you see them pop around and, but, um, so, but what I would say is that, uh, that, that's really the problem is that, if you're taking a more critical approach of the text and saying, okay, these are probably scribal exercises, certainly you look at somebody like Wright's book, uh, the title of which is now no longer dawning on me, um, uh, but where he makes the comparison between the laws of Hammurabi and what you see in the Covenant Code, you know, now you can really entertain and, and start to deal with, okay, scribal exercises, these, these, this is, you know, passed down in, in scribal education, and that's where these are coming from, and that, that, but making uh, sort of, I don't know, melding the two together, I think becomes problematic because if you're, if you're saying, if you guys are saying, or if someone says uh, that this Mount Sinai event actually took place and that these laws were handed down from Yahweh, as the text says, that they sort of have to be legislative. So I mm -hmm. might've uh, not understood what I was saying. So the, the Decalogue is from, is from Yahweh directly. And I do take a plain reading of the text. I'm obviously a believer follower, so I, I take this as from the Lord. But um, when it comes to the law codes, I think that the law codes are an extension of God giving authority to judge to make calls for these particular cases. And we, you can, we can go through the kind of structure, how that works out from judges to Moses. And, and I know that, uh, so in Exodus 21 through 24, you have laws related to the land and they're not even in the land. And so that brings up who wrote this section. You know, that's another topic. But the reason why when Exodus was, was compiled, at least from the scholarship that I've been reading, is that these two chapters were put up against the Decalogue to be a compendium to show this is how Israel applied the law at this particular time, at this particular occasion. But when you get like made them right before they go into the land, like in Deuteronomy, you have a, they're actually laws that contradict each other in some ways, it seems, you know, I, how to set up the altar or where God's presence is going to be. And you're like, what's going on here? But I don't think it has to necessarily be contradiction. It could be, here's a different circumstance. Here's a further outworking of how they think this makes sense. I mean, like even as a Christian, I was telling Steve the other day, like I'm still working out in my own life what it means to love God with my whole heart and love my neighbors myself. So 10 years ago and how where I'm today, that looks different. And I think we should expect to see in the Hebrew Bible, God actually showcasing for us, hey, here's the people of God progressing towards the ideal, ultimately to the new covenant. And of course, new covenant was prophesied in Jeremiah. So these aren't like just made up things. These are obviously in the scriptures. That's why we see a continuity rather than a discontinuity. But anyways, I wonder that, that I clear up what I meant by the league. I do think it's legislation that is from Yahweh in that God has authorized judges to make these calls for the people of God. I don't think it perfectly reflects the ideal, but I do think that God allowed this to take place. So I, I don't think I would say. No, I, oh, I, no, I understand. God, right. one, not, okay. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I understood you the first time. I, I, I think that uh, the text lays out that they're from Yahweh, right? I think that's the point. It actually changes, though. It changes. It changes from Exodus 20. is It's actually the Lord speaking to now they're speaking of God in like the third person. It's it's a change of speech. It's, it's clear that uh, Exodus 20 and Exodus 21 was not written at the same time. Um, and there is obviously a... Um, yeah, I think what's happening, sorry, but I think what's happening is we're trying to hold one hermeneutical or interpretive model in, in, in the same hand as we're holding like a critical set of critical scholarship 
and it, it doesn't really work. It can't work that way. Well, would you say would you say Sarna is um, critical scholarship? Michael Michael Heiser, I know he's evangelical, but he holds to this view. Yeah, it's, um, it's there's sorry, it's 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 so comp it's so complicated last... to discuss this topic. Yeah. Uh, I, I have an entire chapter that I'm dedicating to it in the second edition of the slavery book I, because it's that well, complicated. I'd love to... I love all right, so I guess I've maybe read, I've maybe your, I've I, I've read all of your books and the books that you referenced on this topic. So there awesome. are also people that you have referenced that have this opinion too. I wish I would have written that down on this particular passage. That would have been helpful. But I'm just trying to say that this isn't um, the way I'm presenting it is not like oh this is just like some right wing conservative evangelical can, approach. Now, can even, you even non believers? No, uh, people that would say, hey, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in Yahweh yet. Um, time, I gentlemen, time. <laughs> All right, I got to I got to lay the law down on the time here. If not, we'll go five it. more minutes and then um, we're going to get to the outros right. here. And you guys, uh, of course, the people who are saying, yes, the Bible does condone mm -hmm. slavery. You're going to go last. We're going to let Dr. Boyce and Jonathan go first. They're going to be five minute closings. Q and a will happen after that, everybody. So if you want to get your question in super chat, your question now. And um, once we run out, um, we will obviously end the show. So with that being said, um, go ahead, let me know when you're ready and I'll hit start for the outro close. Who's, who's going first? Uh, you guys. Okay. Right. okay. Let me know when sure. you're ready. All right, go ahead. So the, the basis of our, our argument for today is that when you're looking at the meta narrative that's been laid out, whether you're talking about the original design of God through his intention of a new creation that is not solely based on a Israelite kingdom or anything of that sort, it's actually every tribe, tongue, and nation going back to the Abrahamic covenant before Israel was established as a nation. God's desire was to bless all nations through that one nation that God had redemption in mind. God had a plan for all nations in mind, not just his people, that God designed humanity not to be subject to one another. That was a result of the fall where subjection took place. But we see God creating these miniature narratives within the meta narrative of hope and freedom and desire to be a part of something of his eternal kingdom and his new creation, if you would, the new Eden. And that's seen in the prophets, that's seen uh, in the earlier writings of the historical sections, that they're desiring something better, something more uh, than just being a part of a, a broken world that nobody has an answer to. God actually desired to bring all that together. And his goal in doing that was giving evidence of that in places like an idea of Jubilee or to bring together people that can experience what it means to be loved by God. We see God share his love toward and his mercy towards nations that were not Jews, whether it's the Ninevites uh, or looking at some of the people and, and showing pity to Moabite people. We see evidence of this building and that God is actually designed for his people to come to the understanding that we are to love our neighbor as ourself and to work that out. And the work of that is ugly at times. Israel failed in it. They didn't practice it properly or they were prejudiced in their proper propositions of it. And as they became more aware of God's intention of freedom and freedom from, from bondage, these people like in Jeremiah, right before the destruction of the temple, they failed to meet this qualification. God comes down hard, brings severity. Whereas in the law, there was not punishable things outside of, I won't bless you. Now that looks a little bit more strong in its language, where it's, I'm not only not going to bless you, I'm going to bring sword, famine, and pestilence. I'm going to take you down for how you're treating uh, the subject of freedom. And then you find about 200 years later, Nehemiah, same principle. They stopped celebrating the concept of freedom that God has been trying to instill all these years. And he reminds them of what happened to their forefathers in Jeremiah's day and before. And that if you do not take place in this, you're going to experience the same consequences. And they quickly repented and gather themselves and started practicing the right things to do. And then Jesus comes on the scene and reads the greatest emancipation passage from Isaiah 61 and says, Liberty is here, I'm here. This day it's fulfilled in your ears. 
And he's bringing this idea of hope, not just for himself, but for the nations. And that's demonstrated in his ministry, in his ministry to go into all the nations and preach the gospel, to give them this proclamation of freedom. And then in the end of this, Paul, picking up after the resurrection, starts implementing this and showing them that, hey, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither a master or a slave or a male or a female. In Christ, you're one. God is doing a new creation. He's starting that process now. And we need to start applying that. And he challenges people like Philemon that we talked about. He starts challenging people in the church to think differently of culture, di differently of people of different ethnicity and language, so that when we get to the final um, consummation of everything, where in the book of Revelation, you have every tribe, tongue, and nation of male and female of all societal statuses around the throne of the Lamb, worshiping Jesus together in unity. There is not one institution, one language, one tribe. It's all in Christ equal at his throne. He's their king. And in doing that, we see an emancipation of sin, an emancipation of depression, an emancipation of struggle and chaos and war and all the things that sin has brought into the world. And they're instituted in this new creation where there is no more subjects. There is no more this guy's higher than this guy or this man to this woman, et cetera. It is back to the way it was in the original design. So that in, indicates to us through the beginning of these prophecies that long for that day, whether it's the prophets or in the time of the judges, looking for a redeemer, looking for redemption, that in that process, there was always a hope that God would restore Eden, where slavery was not a part of his plan and will not be a part of his new creation in the end. So God clearly does not endorse it from our perspective. He merely regulated it for a specific time, place, and people. Perfect timing wow. on like that right one. Right on. I should Impeccable. learn from Kevin on timing. Well, I did have a timer. It, it does, I guess, help a little bit. <laughs> if you ever need someone to be on time. All right. Uh, we're going to let Dr. Josh, Dr. Kip uh, do yours. And are you sharing that uh, on the screen? You guys want me to share that? Yeah. Josh That's has PowerPoint. PowerPoints. Yep. So, okay, and I'm going to, uh, before I start my closing, um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of grace because I can get through this in five minutes, but it might take me six. Is that all right? <laughs> you guys cool with that? Hey, you guys gave me grace. So hey. here, I'll put six on the clock. And then if you do get it six, I'll, I'll, uh, butt in. Cool. Loving our neighbors, giving you an uh, extra minute. Just <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me know when you're ready. All right. Okay. okay, here we go. Slavery is endorsed within the Bible, and there is at no point any clear direction from the text that the institution as we have defined it is repealed nor even discouraged. Dr. Josh and I have provided clear and decisive evidence that the biblical text and against the cultural backdrop of the wider ancient Near East, that the ownership of people was permitted and even mandated. Members of the community of Israel, the B'nai Yisrael, were provided guidelines for owning their own kinsmen in a state of debt slavery temporarily, as made clear in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Members of the community received provisions for owning their Israelite women permanently, also in Exodus, but temporarily in Deuteronomy. This is slavery. Members of the community were entitled to purchase people who were not part of the community and to keep them for life, to keep their children, and to pass them all down to their sons as part of their inheritance. There was no provision, not at any time, and nowhere in the biblical text anywhere for their release. This is slavery. Moreover, there were no such protections mandated for their treatment as they were contrasted with Israelite slaves. A point of note in this passage in Leviticus is that the instructions provided to protect only the B'nai Yisrael from ruthless treatment, that is, beforech, is clearly contrasted with that of foreign slaves, and it uses precisely the same language as what is used to describe the terror of slavery endured by the Hebrews in Egypt, beforech. Dr. Josh and I have deliberately drawn close attention to the precise language and terminology in the Bible for this discussion. And the reason for this is because so much of this gets lost 
in translation, and Christian apologists end up deliberately or naively misunderstanding what appear to be general statements for what they believe to be specifics. When Exodus 21 says that a man stealer is to be put to death when caught, or in Deuteronomy 23, where it says that runaway slaves are to be given refuge, a common thought is that these rules indicate that freedom was the ideal for all people everywhere, and that these rules trumped any instructions on the acquisition and treatment of slaves. In the instance of the first, a man can easily be misconstrued as applicable to every human male, but it is rather demonstrably clear that these were free men of the community of Israel, the Bnei Yisrael, as made explicit in the revised form of this rule in Deuteronomy 24-7 and in the Septuagint. As for Deuteronomy 23, what appears to be a global prescription is rather applied only to non-Israelite slaves who have escaped to Israel as a prohibition against making extradition treaties with foreigners. Rather than stating how social relationships between men, women, and slaves are structured in the Bible, apologists are keen to marshal vague generalities about freedom and equality in the New Testament to abrogate what appears in the old, or they confuse obvious definitions with ambiguities and appeals to modern language and culture. Indeed, it is often said that as a last resort, even if there were technically slaves in ancient Israel, as captured in war, surely their lot was better than those of the antebellum south, where real objectionable slavery occurred with ruthlessness. Beforech. It might be said of a young unmarried Canaanite girl, after seeing her family slaughtered by the ancient Israelite army and then forced against her will into sexual submission to her enemy, that surely... This is a better result for her than to be left alone in the ruins of her town to die. Surely this is a kindness, a protection, a guarantee for her well-being. It is unfortunate by the limits of the text that we can't actually know, one way or the other, how much better or worse the treatment of slaves was in ancient Israel than in the antebellum south. But I will remind our audience that this is beside the point of this debate. The Bible unambiguously endorses forms of slavery, and these are never repealed nor discouraged. But one way or the other, we can certainly look to the example set prior to the U.S. Civil War that the apologetics to excuse slavery have not changed much. In the 19th century, Confederate Bishop Stephen Elliott said this, Consider whether by their interference with this institution, they may not be checking and impeding a work which is manifestly providential. For nearly a hundred years, churches have been striving to civilize and Christianize Western Africa, and with what result? A few natives have been made Christians, and some nations have been partially civilized. But what a small number in comparison with the thousands, nay, I may say millions, who have learned the way to heaven and who have been made to know their Savior through the means of African slavery. At this very moment, there are from three to four millions of Africans educating for earth and for heaven in the so vilified southern states, learning the very best lessons for a semi-barbarous people, lessons of self-control, of obedience, of perseverance, of adaptation, of means to ends, learning above all where their weakness lies and how they may acquire strength for the battle of life. These considerations satisfy me with their condition and assure me that it is the best relation they can for the present be made to occupy. Thank you. All right. All right. Beat Did he beat it? He he beat it. Five minutes and 40 seconds. You had 20 seconds oh, on the clock. Right? Yeah. Dr. Kip. You did it. You I did, did it, it in five. I did it in five yesterday. What you I can't even <laughs> um let's do our QA now and we've got quite a few. So before we even begin, I want to let everybody know if you don't want to be here till midnight, um just be mindful that we have a lot to get through here, and we can always do a, in a future in-depth discussion debate on topics or something if we want to keep that in mind. Some of them are statements. Bye. Some of them aren't addressed to certain individuals, so they might seem general, and you guys have to kind of, as adults, pick and choose what you want to address. Uh, be mindful, of course. And um, let's go ahead and begin. So first one is Apollos Christian Apologetics says, I don't get why apologists think defending Old Testament helps. 
It's far easier to say Jesus left a superior covenant and Paul said Torah is figurative, Galatians 4.24. So if you'd like to make a comment, since it isn't so much a question, it's kind of a question. Yeah, that's, but, um, yeah, yeah. Great, a great question. Um, the problem with saying that Jesus left a superior covenant is showing a little bit of maybe ignorance of the fact that the new covenant actually emerges out of the old covenant. So there's such an interconnectedness between the old covenant and new covenant that you can't separate the two. However, there are certain things that Jesus clearly fulfilled. Um, he made mention of fulfilling all the law and the prophets. And, um, and like I said before, there are certain things that were like the case laws to tie back to the topic that were, you know, regulating slavery and particular and other things as well in Israel that would not be, they were culturally time bound. They would not be carried into the new covenant and with that same level of force. Um, so I think it is actually very important for the apologists to say, Hey, if we believe that this is the word of God, then we need to, we need to look at it. Right. And one of the things I, and I hope that it was um, helpful as well too, because when I read Dr. Uh, Bowen's book and he gave all of the, uh, I guess, defenses against your book, I guess that was what you had. I don't know what you called it, but something like that. Um, we did not come at that angle because actually a lot of what people said against your book, Dr. Bowen, I was like, that's terrible. Yeah, that yeah, terrible yeah, way to argue. yeah there's some really and, dumb arguments in there. Though you might think that some of what we brought was terrible as well. I was like, hey, that. Is no, crazy. actually, I think that. I think that your argument is the the best of uh, ones that can be had. Yeah, and we're oh, sorry we didn't get to get into some of the. Maybe we can have you on our channel later and, and talk about Exodus twenty one. I really fun, would but. like to talk more in particular sometime, but you know, it's just the nature of it. it's so much so much content. But we'll blame Doctor Kip Davis since he just house. got here. We'll blame Doctor Kip Davis for taking us down. Like <laughs> I've been listening, listening the whole back, time. So, yeah. it's I was gonna be. I was listening the whole time. I was gonna say it was the second best. So. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Kev. Well, let's press on. Let's keep going because if we don't, that's one. You have a hundred more at least. Oh my so goodness. I, I'm just saying, there's a we lot. We got to sleep tonight, man. Right. I know. That's <laughs> why I, I, I don't want to. I'm going to blame uh, uh, AKA over here. Uh, uh, <laughs> Constellation that's Pegasus good. in the house, Exodus 21 20 through 21. Why don't Israelites practice this today if it's God's law? Can you actually? I haven't memorized Exodus 21. I can read it, I guess. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm, I'm literally I'm, holding Exodus 21 open. If, I memorized the Code of Hammurabi, but not Exodus 21. If any man beats his male or female servant with the rod, it's the rod passage. Uh, beating the, the rod passage there, John. Why think, don't Israelites practice this today if it is God's law? Oh, I see. Uh, well, this comes down to interpretation um, for sure. And um, in rabbinical tradition... The rod was actually reserved as a, um, and uh, it was reserved as the last stitch before the death penalty, and um, and though as you see in the Hebrew Bible, there was abuses of all these laws, and certainly uh, masters would beat their slaves more than just that. But the rod was reserved as that last st stitch effort, and uh, really from their cultural perspective, and I appreciate Dr. Bowen pointing this out that. It wasn't a um, immoral type of thing. And then when you get into the um, poetical literature, didactic literature, um, the rabbis began to read the rod as actually being something more symbolic. And they actually began to interpret it more in that fashion. And I probably obviously would say, hey, that's a good move <laughs> just I because agree. of the, the nature of uh, some of, of the abuse that came from the literal beating people up so um that's probably the move and um i do think that oh i'll stop there short answer sorry derek getting there i'm gonna i'm gonna there, start bro. giving you a look i'm gonna you have to give him a like, timer, you gotta <laughs> give him a timer. That, you know, yeah we should we yeah. should have like a, a limit on time in terms of <laughs> the response I, I should pull this um i'll start to go like this how about that? Um, all right. Well, but, but but we didn't answer that. The second part of that is we didn't believe these laws were instituted forever and forevermore. We believe they were for a specific time, place, location, and people groups. They weren't meant to be forever. They're yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Stupid horror energy. Thank you so much for the super chat. I feel weird even reading the, the name. Um, that's not Dr. Josh. That's just a video of him. I don't, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I, I, I wouldn't even know how to take that. Like, how do you even take that? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're very good friends. So I'm hoping it's a compliment. <laughs> Please take uh, don't beat me up for for even saying her name. So. All right, let me continue here, scrolling down. Okay, Constellation Pegasus, since the Bible evidently says Israelites could own foreign slaves, then does not the Bible accept slavery? Well, that goes, that, well, I don't know. Who's that too? I guess that's, a that's lot right. of these are not, I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, it's towards us, but we, we agree that the Bible is not full of immediate abolitionist moments we would say that God was regulating a certain culture at a certain time to a certain people under certain circumstances in a certain land that these were not forever laws. So yes, we don't see where God says abolish, 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 especially the form of, of term slavery. <clears throat> Cause we got to remember a couple things here. They didn't have prison systems. They didn't have police force. They didn't have banks and loan companies. Um, and in, in, in that process for them to, a lot of people was like, why did they willingly sell themselves in that to begin with? Because they had to live the same way we have to go to the banking at a loan sometimes. I mean, I'm not trying to compare a modern culture to theirs, but like, it's the same to give you an idea. That's how they live. That's how they provided for themselves. That's how they gained land and bought it off and paid for it and then started working their own land and making money off of it in that side of things. So that's why God permitted it still to go on, because if you just abolish the whole system right there, you leave people to starve, you leave people have homes, you leave only the wealthy to rule over the others and, and, and take it into a worse scenario than to regulate something where you're guaranteeing these people are actually being treated fairly, uh, that they're actually going to be able to get their money, uh, that they're actually going to have a release date, Jubilee. So God time. regulating that for the specific time Yep. Uh, would demonstrate yep. that God was working through processes in periods of time under certain circumstances and, and issues that they're... Let's let they're Josh respond to that one, and then we'll continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that um, I, I disagree. Uh, certainly, they had loans. I mean, that's, that's, that's why they... I mean, that's often why they defaulted on them. But um, I, I think that the problem with that view that God couldn't just abolish it is that he essentially did in Leviticus 25, just for Israel, right? And and so I think this is the problem that that uh, from an apologetic standpoint that you face, the hurdle that you have to overcome, is that is that Yahweh says no more. You can't you can't treat an Israelite as an Evid. You can't do it. Here are the other ways that you can handle these things. And had this is what I say is one of the great weaknesses in the argument, um, is that had he stopped. I think you'd have a really good argument for, you know, working this thing out because uh, the holiness code ostensibly comes last. But the fact that it went on and said, so, but here's where you do get your slaves. So, so it seems like the supernatural provision aspect was totally within God's uh, ability. And it's what he, what he said he was going to do. Uh, it's just that it didn't apply broadly. It was just to the Israelites. So Thank I would, you. Thank you. I actually would agree oh, that this is not a talking time. Sorry. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, it'll <laughs> go on and on. It'll go on and on. So Paul F., anyone who says the Bible doesn't condone slavery is lying for God because they know it does and it's wrong. So it's a statement. I'm going to move on. There. I'm going to I'm going to move on because some of this is overlap. You're going to get yeah. statements, Paul. Thank you for that super chat. But if it's like a question or I think like we're not repeating ourselves in the same specifics, uh, I think it's worthy of diving into. Um, can I, Derek, actually, can you give me 20 seconds just to push back on that? Because I, I get frustrated with, with people who say things like lying for God. When yeah, go uh, I mean, uh, Josh and I certainly do not think that, that uh, uh, Jonathan and uh, Stephen are lying here. I appreciate well, that. I'm sure they appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, think that that is a good, and I'm speaking as a moderator, I shouldn't, but I'm just going to say, I think it's a good standard that we stop acting like everyone's lying. <laughs> Some people just may be so reading things differently. Yeah, nauseous. so yeah, it can yeah, get old. Totally. But thank you so much for that. I appreciate you clarifying, Kip. Uh, Paul F., this site, this claiming the Bible doesn't condone, uh, okay, same thing. So this claiming the Bible doesn't condone slavery do so only to minimize the morally reprehensible position of God. 
which is so another can statement. I make a comment on that? Yeah. Can I, yeah. So um comment over. So no, I'm just kidding. We, if, <laughs> if, start your timer. No. <laughs> right, you better. Um so <laughs> if you if you listen to us carefully, we actually did not give much pushback to the particular regulations that uh, Bowen and Kip laid out. We just more framed it with saying, let's look at this with the big meta narrative in, in mind and saying, when you have the Imago Dei, when you have the, the, the great commandments, you have the gospel, uh, it seems to get to the point where, hey, this institution that's regulated is a planned obsolescence and it's going to work itself out in the new covenant. And obviously the big marinara of the gospel is God setting people free through the gospel. So I, I would say that's probably disingenuous to come to that conclusion, what you're saying. So anyways, maybe listen to the debate again. It might help. Congratulations. That was actually not too bad on time there. Uh, thank I'm you so much. <laughs> I'm going to pick on you a little here as we go. No, Dustin, <laughs> Dustin Ellerby, thank you for the super chat since smog. I hope I'm, are we talking about the yeah, dragon in, in, in the yeah. Hobbit? In the hobby. Yes. Yeah. Smog was part of the grand scheme. It was a okay for him to do so since the story wouldn't have been the same if he didn't do so. That's the argument I'm hearing. I don't know if this is a knock on me because I'm the biggest token nerd in the world or something, but I don't <laughs> like 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 I, I've got a whole display of token just here of books and figures and Ooh, so I, I, it's like, it's like, is this your rare. backdrop you're such a novice that it's needs like, to be your backdrop man, man. i i know I, I well i i did it when i actually did an interview with a guy who wrote a book on tolkien i literally turned my entire desk and just kind of sat back and let everybody kind of see my collection under the limelight but um i'm i'm really not sure where like what the point is here maybe you guys can smile was a part of the grand schemes it okay for him to do so like what what like what what i'm trying to see how this is comparable somebody help me can anybody, you guys help anybody josh or Kip? do you get josh it? does it make sense to you because i'm trying yeah, to i mean i think it, i think the assumption is that uh if the narrative as a whole um and, and i think the the comparison here would be that uh, one piece of literature and another piece of literature uh, is the uh, maybe the assumption that underlies this. But uh, so if if smog is a literary device to you know or a part of the story that brings about the ultimate end of the story to develop the narrative, then what he does is what was the word that they used? It's a okay for him to do so. Okay. So, okay. so is this assuming? Help me if I'm formulating this the way you guys are picking this up. Is that having smog whatever the role smog plays in the story an evil which dragon is, so it's bad okay that slavery is this a-okay -okay. it needed to happen as part of the story if you yeah will. I, I mean look the the god uses bad things to bring the ultimate good in a lot of situations including his own people being in slavery mistreated for 400 years i mean this is something john and i were like somewhat joking about the other day i was like the um, united states was quicker to emancipate slaves and god his own people i mean they were there for 400 years we worked quicker than in the u.s i mean like and they weren't just under any kind of slavery they were under task mass slavery i mean so i'm sure there were people that were looking at the way they were being treated by the egyptians saying god where are you like you, you're our you're our god we're your chosen people you've left us in bondage you promised us the deliverer if you think about it, 400 years, that's that's longer than the period that we can go back to with our first president of the United States. I mean, like they were in bondage that long. Like there's no doubt that that was a bad situation. Nobody was like, oh, yeah, this is great. We're having a great time over here. But God used it even in the evil. God has always used, unfortunately, broken and bad and evil things to bring about great good in the end of redemption it doesn't excuse the process. It doesn't make the process easier. Nobody's rejoicing in it. And it doesn't mean that God approved of everything that happened in it, but he uses it to bring about that redemptive narrative that John and I were talking about. Like that the, the redemptive narrative isn't pr painted pretty on every picture. Like it, it actually looks ugly at times uh, in the process. So I don't know if I'm answering the guy's question, but uh, it was I think, beautiful. I think, yeah, I'm glad you responded. Um, Sentinel Apologetics, appreciate Rob for being in here. Question, Josh used 
Wedgwood's Am I Not a Man and a Brother? Anti-slavery draw, drawing that Darwin used with Acts 1726 to defend his uh, monogenesis of humans. If the Bible condones slavery, why did Darwin use it? Is this the picture that was in the PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I picked it because it was a picture of a slave. But uh, <laughs> so... Uh, if the Bible condones slavery, why did Darwin use it? Why did Darwin use the Bible? Is that the question? I mean, I think this is, I think this, if that is the question, uh, it seems like it's a, the same sort of question that somebody asks when they say, well, if the passages in the Hebrew Bible are actually uh, endorsing slavery, why would the slave Bible, why would the masters uh, in the antebellum South cut out those sections? Uh, I think neither of those uh, follow, right? That that uh, so, for example, with the slave Bible, the assumption that the reason that they would have kept them in, uh, or the reason that they cut them out, had to do anything at all with Leviticus twenty five forty four to forty six, I think is sort of silly. Uh, the whole the whole narrative. I mean, as you guys were talking about earlier, like what is the main thing that comes up over and over and over? It's the Exodus, right? I mean, like it's what it's built upon. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's why they took it out. You don't, you don't want an Exodus in there because uh, that's uh, so. Yeah, I'm not. Maybe I didn't understand this question, but that's. And Kip apparently did not like my answer. He's like, I was going to say he had an Exodus yeah. just now. Like, he, uh, he, you mentioned Exodus, and he took it literally. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be back um and this question anyway doesn't it's not toward him but uh stupid horror energy thank you again for the super chat uh what does jonathan think of this evil evil is that which should be should not be permitted god or sorry good is that which should be permitted god permits and regulated slavery therefore slavery is good yeah, so that um, I see the syllogism there. Thank you for expressing that clearly. Um, so I think this actually is a bit too simplistic, and let me explain. So I want my children to um, live for what is good. I think I think probably all of us here that have children would want that. However, I'm careful about what I pick to help train my children towards development. I don't land blast them with everything and say, Adrian, this is my son. Here's a list of all the good and here's the list of all the bad and I'm going to pound you every day with it. Probably wouldn't be the way to actually help him in his own development. And I do think you have God presenting the ideals. I know there's disagreement among us about this, but the ideals of loving God and loving your neighbor yourself, um, those are good. I wouldn't see any evil in it. When they went about to make application off of the Decalogue and they began to say, Hey, let's treat slaves this way, which they would have seen um, as an improvement upon, especially where they came from Egypt. They're like, Hey, this is, this is what it looks like to do all that God has commanded. But actually it doesn't quite get, get them there. And God doesn't say, well, you know, you didn't, you're not quite the ultimate people that I want. So I'm just going to forsake you and find someone else. We find someone who's gracious and forgiving. And I'm thinking like, ooh, there's some good qualities, forgiveness, goodness. Like if God was just saying, if you're if you're bad, you're out. And if you're good, you're in. Man, God would be really maybe impossible to approach at all. So this is what I'm trying to point out is that this is actually pretty complex. And this might be a little bit of a simplistic question. It is a great question, though, and I feel the heat of it. So thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul F says God can ban shrimp in one go, but not slavery. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know who has to answer this, but uh, I'm not sure if it's a really good one-to-one -one comparison here, shrimp versus slavery. But um, I'm not really sure if uh, Stephen. I don't know if you want to take a stab at it. Well, this is part of the ceremonials <clears throat> as well as their restrictions for a specific time. And once again, as we see in the New Testament, these laws were meant for a specific people for a specific time under circum uh, certain circumstances that was not to be imposed forever. They're ceremonial. Wow. They were done away with. Peter had to learn this lesson the hard way. 
in the New Testament. He struggled with it. Paul seemed to have a lot easier of a time with this. Uh, I realized food is food, meat is meat, drink is drink, day is a day, whatever day you want to celebrate. It's all the same. It's all the Lord's day. Uh, You want to drink wine, drink wine. You don't want to drink wine, don't drink wine. It's all the same. Like Paul struggled with this as a Jew very briefly. Peter had a much more difficult time with this than than Paul did. Uh, These things were not the point. And that was what, what Paul tried to draw out in Romans, particularly in Galatians. These were not the point. And everybody got wrapped up in these little things like shrimp or then explicitly shrimp. It just describes a shrimp. It's a bottom feeder that implied to catfish and lobster or whatever, anything else you want to put in there. Pig. These were unclean animals. These were a part of a restriction list. But it was it was more than that. Even the, even in the early church, like embellished this idea like, wow, the jo- Jews really missed the whole point of that, including like. Uh, the epistle of Barnabas goes through great detail saying, boy, the Jews screwed this up. I mean, they, they actually missed the point of what it represented more than they did the literacy of it. So they're like, oh, you misrepresented that. That really meant you shouldn't do this kind of immoral sin. So they went to the, the church actually went, I think, too far with their interpretation of doing away with these things. But the whole idea here is once again, these were not forever established laws that were meant for everybody. And Paul put an obliteration to that idea. These were specific people for a specific time. It's specifically for the Jews. They were awaiting a a bloodline to come through them that was anticipated from the very beginning of of Adam and Eve, a bloodline that would come from them and keeping that bloodline pure. Once that bloodline person came, Messiah, they felt there was no necessity for a lot of these ceremonial laws anymore. Sacrificially, no need for it. Christ came. All these... uh, uh, judicial laws that prevented them from certain food groups, irrelevant. So that 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 would be my answer to that. I'm not even sure what they're insinuating. Can, there, can I try to just like 20 seconds steel yeah. man this? I think the point that they were making is a bit of a hyperbolic thing. Um, and I, I think maybe a more solid example would be uh, something like the idea of rape, right? What we would view as rape today is certainly not what they viewed as rape in the Hebrew Bible. Right. So when you look at something like um, Deuteronomy 22, you know, you can make these, you can say, well, look here, they say that 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 rape is bad. Right. It's illegal. The problem is that what they defined as rape was different from what we define it as. We define it much more broadly. So something like Deuteronomy 21 is rape as we define it today. Uh, And so I think that this idea of consent on the part of the woman in particular is not something that the Hebrew Bible in any way engages with. And that, so, so uh, these are the types of things that I think um, that the person is saying, look, he can make a, Yahweh can make a strong statement about don't do X, but he decided not to do it over on this other thing. I, I think I represented it correctly. Thank you. You were incorrect. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> As <laughs> thank always. You so much. Uh, Sabra, thank you so much for the super chat. Derek, what are you doing hosting a podcast during the Seahawks game? Hashtag Washington State blasphemy. My family is all, they they do all of this and I'm out here working. I mean, you got to get me to this, right, Derek? This Washington State stuff. <laughs> I am. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn. I really appreciate it. And uh, please don't take any disrespect. I told the guys in private, but also just to nudge us along because that way you you don't feel like uh, I hate this guy. He's kept me on the show for so damn long. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sentinel Apologetics is back. Beasley, it's Dr. Okay, Dr. Beasley. (laughs) You're the first Christian to finally use William J. Webb's excellent chart of that evolution of regulated laws toward the glorious gospel. So it's just a praise to you for doing that. Look, I get a shout out, guys. But but to be clear, we don't agree with everything in Webb either. Just just we don't agree with all his conclusions. Just to be clear. Go ahead. Yeah, I do think. uh, Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep going. Thank you. Yeah. Constellation Pegasus, I can't accept the moving forward defense. That's nothing but an opinion. God could have ended slavery there since the Jews didn't have slaves during the Exodus. Well, that's true. That's why a lot of these laws are hypothetical what if scenarios when you get to the land kind of ordeal, as John demonstrated. Like, hey, when this about the land, it's like, what land? They're intense moving around for, you know, 40 plus years before they actually get to the land. These are hypothetical situations when they get accustomed into the land and ingrained in culture and and, and encountered with all these other nations. They weren't fully established at that point. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm look, I can tell you right now, just based on this, like there's a whole nother discussion that needs to be had and, and uh, on all of this. So 
we don't have to get everything out, you know, but it's it's important that you guys get a comment on these. Carlos Rodriguez, it's silly that an all-powerful God has to gradually regulate slavery and divorce practices out of his people until they're able to reach his ideal, but is emphatic from the start about exclusive worship. Well, I, I've rarely seen people that like the idea of God stopping them and making them do something they don't want to do immediately. Like, I, I, I haven't met many. Go ahead, John. I was going to say, in some ways, it's kind of like, hey, man, step in line. We are all kind of in the, like, why did God do that mode? <laughs> you know, often, I mean, even as a believing person, I'm like, why? I, I don't like the idea personally that, that slavery was regulated for that long period of time. I don't personally like that. And one thing that we all can rejoice in this room, this chat room, I guess you'd say, is that none of us agree with slavery. That's an awesome right. thing that we're all like, slavery is bad. I almost said that at the beginning, but I was like, that is moderate. incredibly refreshing, just yeah. by the way. Like, because <laughs> I don't always get that. Well, that's, yeah, sad. You, that's sad. Yes, it's really Thanks sad. Thanks for making that statement. Seriously, uh, appreciate that. Your long lost pal, you can deny condoning slavery, positive endorsement, but it certainly justifies slavery, neutral balance, uh, neutral allowance. Couldn't a living God reject slavery? The answer is yes. He could have rejected slavery. And for his purposes, he regulated it. And so that's what I could say to that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like we're again, saying the same thing five, six times. It, it, well, I'm. It's good to, yeah. I mean, these yeah, are yeah, yeah. super, yeah, super yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. these bros. <laughs> I mean, he paid for that question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, and sometimes they're just voicing a deep-seated issue that I think you guys also agree with. This is why I think it's a struggle or a wrestle in, in, in your guys' mind as well, like okay. I'm trying to wrestle with this issue. This is why it's a debate today. So Logan Fisher, Genesis 9, 24 through 25, Canaan is cursed to be slave to Shem. Is it ever okay to use slavery as punishment? I think that's a misunderstanding of curse of Shem. Yeah. So I just think that that is actually not in the, the same thing. Um, Trying to recommend who does a good work on unpacking the wrong estimation of even just like kind of black people being under a curse, being less than human. Um, am I on oh, yeah. the right track of what they're thinking? I think, um, yeah, I, most don't hold to that as being – same thing so i don't know if anybody wants to add anything or do you josh guys want to did josh or kip want to add any context to that or no no good okay uh olive blake thank you again for the super chat do you believe like paul that modern day slaves should obey their masters in fear and trembling and do not let them let it concern them first corinthians seven twenty one. so let me give an analogy modern day where it is legal to be uh, to endorse or to enforce slavery, do you believe that they should be obeying this command of Paul in slave running countries? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, if I was talking to someone who was a slave in another country who was, let's just say they're a Christian, just to keep in the context here, I would tell them that they're in that, that circumstances and they should do everything they could to to live out the gospel in that particular circumstance yet I would be working really hard and anybody that I could get involved to abolish that practice of slavery. <laughs> so there would be both, Hey, let's make sure that we live in light of the gospel. Yeah. So that's kind of Paul's, what he would say where I would go maybe a bit further. Paul didn't give any admonitions of abolishing slavery. And I kind of wish he did. <laughs> I would say that I'm not saying that he's wrong, that he didn't. I just kind of wish that's like, oh, I mean, wouldn't we all like to hear more of that? I mean, I think that we wouldn't argue as much over over about it. But um, I would do that to approach. Hey, keep living for the glory of God. Um, seek to to live out the gospel. Yet we need to stop this. You know, we well, need to. See yeah, to, and to I think these. Paul would have Paul would have loved to live in our day where it, it, slavery is abolished in many, many, many places. Uh, even in his day, every culture, especially in the Greco-Roman Empire, was infiltrating. Like It was him against a whole system. We're not fighting that system here right now. Uh, we could fight for people who are decision. still in that system. So I think Paul would have loved to be in our position because I'm. he, he would have been what John, I think what John just said would have been his approach. Thank you so much. Appreciate that super chat. Subislav says, by giving laws for slavery, it is definitely not. 
Not what? I don't, I don't get it. I don't either. It's definitely not slavery. By giving laws for slavery, it's definitely not. And I don't know about the not part because the hard part is that you guys are saying it's not condoning slavery, right? So this sounds almost – the first part makes me think that they're actually siding with Dr. Josh and Kip. Uh, but then it, it, it kind of I, – I don't know the context. Oh, to is it trying to say that because it's giving laws to regulate it? That it's that somehow it's not, definitely not that, condoning it, maybe? Maybe that's what it I is. I think maybe that's, that's – It could be. That could be it. Okay. So it might be on your guys' side then. Okay. Thank you so much for the super chat. Courageous says, to Boyce and Beasley, do you think this is the most reasonable for Yahweh to regulate it and not condemn it and allow by his followers till the 1800s? Well, I don't think I think it's um, I think it's a tragedy that the church took a long time to come around to um, abolishing slavery. However, I do think you actually have plenty of examples prior to the 1800s. Oh, so, yeah. um, like, for instance, Augustine, the uh, Augustine's church actually bought slaves to set them free. And they, he would, the church had quite a bit of a network in that particular time period. So they would they would actually try to get the, them back to their families. They did a raid actually on a um, like a boat, a ship that was going out. And they they actually kind of broke the law and saved 120 some slaves from the ship. Um, so there are definitely examples actually all the way back to the early church. And arguably, I mean, we talked about Philemon actually being an example of that. I know that was debated, but we do see in the early church a, a, begin, a more of a working out of this person is creating the image of God. They shouldn't be treated as property, so on and so forth. So, um, okay. so I would maybe adjust that a little bit. But I also kind of agree with the the, the sentiment of like, oh yeah, I wish this would have came out uh, sooner. But um, that's a, a point where like. Israel was in slavery for 400, was it 450 years in slavery? I thought it was like 430, but yeah. Come on, guys, be precise. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, right. yeah. 400 I mean, like, plus. Why, why that long? But yet, you know, there's there's a purpose to it from our standpoint. And, 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 and also to add to that, the, the slavery laws and all of those things, by the time Jesus had come and proclaimed the liberty that he did, those laws should have been obsolete. The fact that churches later in the United States started reinforcing something that they should have known other churches and church history like Augustine. And, and there's multiple stories where this happens. Augustine was the most popular because they actually, like John said, went out personally trying to get people free and buying slaves to free them. They were abusing scripture for their own purposes. Like, I mean, they, they, they clearly did not understand what Jesus was intending to do. They clearly didn't understand what John and I are trying to say, because had they done that, they wouldn't have personally abused and then cut sections out of their Bibles to excuse what they were doing. So obviously it was malicious. Their intent was clearly malicious. And just so you know, uh, Kip and Josh, feel free at any moment to just jump in. I'm, I know you guys are thinking, Okay, there's going to be something that's going to come up, I'm sure. But feel free if you feel like you want to say, even if you just want to say, I disagree. You're more than welcome to, but I know you don't want to stir the pot and everything keeps going. So Apollo's Christian apologetics. Huh? Did you have something to say? No, I, I was I was going to I was going to push back a little bit and maybe tangentially. But I think one of the big problems in a discussion like this is the fact that the biblical text is as elastic as it is. Um, I mean we all have our own ideas about what the right way is to interpret the text. And I would suggest that, that, that some people have a better handle on that than others, but it's never been easy and it's never been straightforward. And I think that's a, that's a serious problem, um, which lends me to think that, or lends me to, to conclude that making a defense from the text uh, is as difficult as it is. Thank you. Uh, Apollo's Christian apologetics. I think because Christians had no political powers, why they humbly submitted unto corrupt government Caesar. They were more concerned with individual salvation versus government. Also, sorry, I misjudged second team as fundies. Yeah, I wanted to say to this, uh, Laura, Robbins, uh, Laura Robinson and I uh, 
went on Shannon Q's channel a couple of years ago and sort of talked about slavery. I brought the Hebrew Bible A&E side. And of course, as a New Testament scholar, she brought the New Testament stuff. And this was sort of the thing that she was really getting at is that, you know, the Hebrew Bible is much more presenting it, even though it wasn't reality, right? Uh, historically speaking, um, it was presenting a much more top-down approach. Like, here are the laws. This is how you're going to do it. The New Testament is ostensibly doing this from a, okay, look, you're not in power, right? This is not the situation where you have control to make these laws, right? So here's here's the way you survive in this, and here's the way you you operate within the circumstances in which you find yourself. So I think that's actually a really important thing to pay attention to in this. Interesting. Yeah. Gives you perspective. Thank you so much. Zerg, I appreciate the super chat. Question for Mr. Beasley. What does the meta narrative of Jesus' love and redemption have to do with slavery? Paul, Christians often talk about being a slave to Christ. Doesn't that make slavery sound good, normal? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's there's paradoxes in scripture um so like for instance like in order to live you have to die in order to, to go up you need to go down and so there are aspects of hey become a slave of god and be free it's just like it's a paradox but that's actually the christian the christian message is that through becoming a possession of god so his own people you actually become free because you are actually now reinstated to how God has created mankind. So now you're, you're reconciled to the creator. And now you're set up for human flourishing, but there is certainly that motif. And remember that the culture to, to which this was written in slavery, wasn't a moral issue. So this type of analogy would have not kind of struck them as something as, as strange in their mind. So hopefully that's enough for right now. Well, and, and with that, just 10 second ad, the, the perspective of Paul there was that you are a slave to sin. It's better to be under the, the, the bond servitude of, of Christ who said, take my yoke. It's easy. It's light. And I'm meek and lowly of heart than have a task masking slave of sin. So the analogy was actually, you're always going to be a slave to something. Jesus is the, the freer of slaves, and then you serve him in return out of gratitude because he freed you from the bondage of the, the evil taskmaster of sin. So there, there, there's there's a lot more to the theology there too in Romans. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just expect that uh, Josh and Kip will butt in if they want to say anything. So Sentinel Apologetics, Kip, Paul's application of such intimate language to Onesimus demonstrates a profoundly theological point the gospel shatters social boundaries and brings slaves and masters into one family in Jesus. And I will, I, I think at this point, I'll just, I'll just reiterate what I, what I noted before that, uh, that this is all still um, exclusively within the family of Jesus. So the only way within, uh, within, within Paul's instruction to to have a chance at freedom whatever you know however that looks to him because it certainly doesn't look the same as it does to to us today uh that is still within the exclusive confines of the Christian community to the exclusion of who's outside whoever is outside of it but it was also something that was extended to all though. Like, Hey, you can, you can come in. So why I, I'm not quite following. Well, yeah. Conditional in, in, in a belief standpoint from a belief standpoint. Yeah. I don't. So like, sorry, if, if, I, don't don't the, belief, I, I don't see, maybe it's just me, but I don't see the Liberty there. Well, if you don't, if you don't believe and you're like, I don't believe that, then you wouldn't want to be a part of the community. Right. We can. All move right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Germania, this has been a civil and informative debate. Thanks, panelist and Derek. Oh, and that Dr. Josh fella sounds really smart. Listen, you can't you can't pay any attention to this guy, <laughs> Germania. He uh, he can't even ground the ultimacy of the necessary preconditions <laughs> to establish his possible impossibilities in the ground of all being. So, <laughs> yeah. 
Josh has that one memorized. Thank you, Gur. Appreciate that. <laughs> you he does. To. He does. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate it. And everybody, go subscribe to Gur Mania's YouTube channel. He's kind of trying to grow this community. We got to keep it growing. So yeah. thank you. Um, Olive Blake again. Why did God say not to rule over fellow Israelites ruthlessly, but doesn't say the same about foreigners? In fact, he says it in contrast to foreigners. Actually, <clears throat> in dealing with sojourners, he told them, you were once slaves in Egypt and you were dealt going back to their task mastery type of treatment. They were dealt with harshly. He said not to treat them that way. So actually, he, he does tell them not to task mask the same way they were task mask. He tells them not to treat them that way, actually. Okay. Thank you so much. Paul F. says, does Jubilee apply to anyone except Israelites? No. I think it's the reverse, right? You're, uh, the argument earlier was simply, it's really the B'nai Elohim, or Elohim, uh, Israel is Elohim. <laughs> there we go. Derek is a walking uh, textual, textual, uh, text critical issue. Imbecile is what the term is. <laughs> we, yeah. We we I think we had room, room for disagreement a little bit, but I do think primarily that is true. It, it is primarily the case, yes. But not, I, I would actually say it's not in every, and we di we disagreed earlier on that. So there's no point repeating it. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that support and uh, the continuous super chats. I'm scrolling down, gentlemen. Carlos Rodriguez, a supposedly God-written or inspired Bible that evolves, develops, and improves moral behavior over time is indistinguishable from human-inspired book written for political and cultural purposes. Yeah, that's a great that's a great thought. Here's where I push back. The ideals were actually given um, in a, maybe not explicit way, of course, but in the creation narrative. And then in the law of God stated early on, I mean, like right out of the gate, God making a covenant with his people gave them the ideals. And when they went to apply the ideals, they didn't do it perfectly. And God was gracious. So it's it's actually quite different in my estimation. I, I'm sure Josh would have to push back on that, but <laughs> no, I'm okay. inviting can, you. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with this point uh, is that, um, you know, trying to, trying to establish a distinction, like how, what is the test that you would have to distinguish between, um, you know, one and the other? I think it would be incredibly difficult. Do you believe the ideals that are laid out in the, the, the Torah? I mean, we'd probably have to define what ideals means. Uh, well, I guess if, like you use the word ideals for the law. I'm saying that the letter of the law is not the ideal. I'm saying the spirit is. And the yeah, spirit I, I think I used I mean, it. I mean, I don't, I don't have the quote in front of me how I used it, but I, I think it was in the, the question of sources and how do we establish what the laws were from a source standpoint. Um, and so if you, you can't, like, as you were pointing out, you can't look at Jeremiah 34 and say, um, in the same way that you can't look at somebody beating their slave to death in the antebellum South and see, and say, see, it was okay to beat your slave to death. Or that was the law. You would say, no, that's not what the law was in the antebellum South. This is, this, this did not reflect, uh, the ideal However, I was using that in the in the in the in the text, but um, you know, I mean, to me, that's such a complicated question because it depends on which interpretive model you're taking. Yeah. Um, mm. So, and we probably don't have time for that. Sorry. Thank you. No, appreciate. I, that. I want to get more into that with you sometime. We, ha I'd love to. Absolutely, uh, Lou. Thank you for the super chat question for Josh. Is being under contract a form of being someone's someone's part uh, property? If not. Please explain. Uh, no. And I think, <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I think I define what I mean uh, by things like uh, slavery and this, the, these, these property aspects. Um, but a contract, uh, I, th I, th I just, what I, I guess what I'm saying is I think the distinction between these two things is... Um, one of being able to walk away. So for example, uh, if, if the implication here is somebody like, um, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a sports player. 
that's so sad. What I don't sport? watch a lot of sports. <laughs> I don't know. Any sport. Let's say that they're signed to a contract. LeBron James. Go there ahead. you go. Uh, so LeBron James is signed to a contract. Uh, is he the property of the Lakers, the Lakers. Thank you. Uh, you should just be doing this for me. Uh, (laughs) no. Right. Um, uh, because the way that I think we need to think about this is a Venn diagram, right? This is, this is part of the problem that I see with these types of questions is that when you have two uh, terms that have a range of meaning, there's going to be a place where the two terms uh, come together and there's this semantic range that applies to both of them. It's a fallacy to then say, well, yeah, for wife, for example, in the Hebrew Bible, they would not have considered a wife to be a slave. They were slave wives, but they would not have considered a normal wife to be a slave. But there is semantic overlap. Semantics, not really the right word. There, are, There's a constellation of characteristics that overlap between wife and slave, right? Or children and slave or child and slave. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because there's overlap between those two, that a child is now a slave or a wife is now a slave. So there is overlap between them. But it has to be substantive enough. That constellation of characteristics has to group tightly enough together and to be enough of them to say that uh, one should be categorized as the other. Hope thank that you. made sense. Lou, thank you for the super chat. Hank says, love thy neighbor unless God says you can take his stuff, massacre his family, and take his daughters as spoils as war. I said love i'm I'm just going to i'm just going to point out that's a misunderstanding of who your neighbor is you're not you so so to put put it more direct to answer hank here loving thy neighbor you're saying it's not universal so if he's yeah if he's got if he's got the uh the old testament texts in mind uh, insofar as uh, massacring his family and taking his daughters as spoils of war, these people were never regarded neighbors of Israel. Well, I mean, neighboring nations, but the individual these were never these were never ra'im. These were not the these were not your friends and, and neighbors. These were these were the goy. These were the outsiders. Thank you so much. Hank. Do you do you see an expansion of 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 loving your neighbor actually applied to the outsider in the new covenant, a new testament? I know you're not a New Testament scholar. Yeah. The great so Samaritan, think- they were a half breed. The whole story about what does it mean to love your neighbor and who is your neighbor? Jesus uses Samaritan to make that point. I'm just curious to how you fleshed it out. No, I would I, I would agree with that. I think there is a there is a, there is an extension insofar as who can be included within that in group. Um, and I think it gets it gets ever expensive, but but this um, also is is not. I I wouldn't see it as a product of a biblical ethic as much as I would see it as a a product of a social um, social change that uh, that occurs, you know, over time, long after the Bible has fallen silent on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Paul F. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, he's referring to Leviticus 19, 18. Neighbors are fellow Israelites. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor. So we should ask Paul what what Jesus thinks. (laughs) It actually is in line with what you're trying to say about the neighbor. But of course, the context that you're describing with the Samaritan seems like there's an experience at least it's starting to do something more than what it was for sure. Well, the love your neighbor, um, principle though though this exact wording is right from leviticus 19 but it actually occurs in several forms in different contexts so this you need to expand your 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 study of the term not just the exact phraseology but yeah go ahead Steve. no we can move i'm we can move on that's fine i was just gonna say to be like really fair um the the, the idea of um just general social justice in the land is something that is uh, something that is uh, incredibly important um, to all, uh, at least the ones that yeah. come into this into this context, ancient Near Eastern cultures that that again fall into this discussion. Um, 
and this often includes care for the foreigner, right? That comes in. I mean, right. But again, you can right. see this yeah. in other. Yeah. Uh, but right. it's the, and I think that's a point where yeah. that Israel's code is not unique in showing care for the foreigner because that was just a common practice. That was a customary law. I mean, in most ancient civilizations. And and that's what I was gonna say. Like there actually is care for the foreigner and and to treat him a certain way that you would want to be treated. But yeah, yeah Josh. Yeah. Bowen, is there anything um, stated in law codes that actually explicitly said, love your neighbor as yourself? I didn't see it. I'm just curious if you, you knew that. Uh, not that I know of, uh, but uh, I'd have to go back looking for that specific thing. And it's not uniform, right? I mean, uh, sorry, I'll move on. I was just going to say, like, the Hittite laws seem to have a slightly different take, at least in, in degree. Uh, on some of these things, but um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fred Harvey, thank you for the super chat. The question in the debate is not does God, but does the Bible? Question to Jonathan is, does the Bible condone slavery? Yes or no? Yeah, so I would, um, I would be equating those things as the same thing because God is the author of the ultimate author, I should say. Of, of scripture from our our perspective. I know there's different views, but that's the view that we would hold to. So I would make a distinction between those two things. Though there are things in the Bible that we have to make sure that it's stated, it's recorded for us in God's word, but it's not necessarily sanctioned by God himself. So, But that would be a different topic. So if you said, does God condone slavery? Does the Bible condone slavery? I would say ultimately no. Um, so I would hold to the same argumentation. Just watch the whole debate over again, and you'll see why. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Fred. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting way of phrasing it. Thank you. Boyd White says, condone means to accept or allow. Is there any explicit verse in the Bible that admonishes slavery in general, or it only found, it's only found by finding a meta narrative which could be subjective per reader? Uh, let's let Kip and Josh answer first, and then if you feel like responding, just to get your guys' take on that. Isn't this what you were saying earlier, Kip? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think I, I I made this point at some point in our uh, in our back and forth. Um, that if if we're just going to read the text itself, then I think it's very difficult to come to a straightforward conclusion. Uh, that there's anything but, uh, uh, you know, a commendation or, or an endorsement or an allowance of the institution. And I think there's, there's maybe an important point. There's an important distinction here to be made between the institution of slavery and, you know, the treatment of slaves. Um, and the Bible is really quite silent on you know, the institution beyond, uh, you know, its existence and the laws and the stipulations that are put in, or the, 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 the principles that are put in place to, uh, to ensure its smooth operation. Can I ask a clarifying question real quick? Um, to I'm me, gonna ask it. uh, well to you or, um, Dr. Okay. Bowen here as well, but like, under your persuasion, does the Bible actually command Israel to own slaves or does it permit and then regulate? Is there any command that says you need to own slaves? Anything in well, form like that? So in, in the sense that, that it was binding, no. But the reason for that is because um, it's, a, it's an economic question. I mean, the text recognizes that not everybody is in a position to own slaves. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate that. Dafa says, I want to know whether all of you agree that the Old Testament is fluid book, having fluid text, canon, and not fixed God words like many Jews today believe, also not inerrant. That scared me for a minute. I thought somebody just donated you seventy nine thousand dollars. I was like, "Wow, <laughs> I was wow!" Like, I, I wish I'd be wow. like, "All right, into the stream, ladies." And gentlemen. <laughs> Derek probably knows exactly how much that is, though. I actually don't. I actually don't. Oh. There's people all over the world who watch what we do here. So, anyways, sorry guys. That's really cool. 
Um, okay, so I, back to the question. Uh, <laughs> all of you agree that I know. I don't think we would all agree on this question. Um, so we would have a nuanced approach to how we articulate inerrancy. Um, yes. for sure. But I would distinguish ourselves from some of the fundamentalists, how they would talk about inerrancy or like we kind of, we hold to more of a providential view of inspiration. though I think there are exceptions, but not a, um, like God dictated every single word and it got written down perfectly. I mean, any type of study of manuscripts too, would just kind of move you from a, a dogmatic approach to that. Um, but we do, we would affirm inerrancy, but with a very nuanced way. Stephen, you're, this is your terrain. So you might want to speak. To well, you might, no, I mean, you, you pretty much answered it the, the same way I would. So we'll let our, our friends over here give their, it will surprise no one to know that I, I, I do not affirm inerrancy. What? What? <laughs> they told me you did. That's what they said. <laughs> <when> I... <laughs> oh, thank you, Dafa. Appreciate the question. Discovering ancient history with Pat Lowinger. Pat in the house. When is the debate on slavery in the early Christian church going to happen? Great job, Josh and Kip. I will say that this is Never. Pat's. Uh, Pat's been doing a lot of work on this recently, slavery in the early church. Yeah. Um, so you guys might want to have a discussion with him about yeah, it. Yeah, you probably it? should. Let's we probably should have an Exodus 21 discussion with you before we ever get to the early church, but okay. Well, Pat, we be... could just set, set both up. Why not? Set both hey, up. Um, the person who's um, asked the question, a good book on this. I don't know if you've read this, you guys, Kip or Bowen, but um, on Dixon's book, have you read uh, Slaves and Bullies? Oh, wait, not Slaves. <laughs> they got Slaves in there. Uh, Saints and Bullies. <laughs> we talk about slavery all night, guys. Saints and Bullies by John Dixon. Um, it's a really insightful book, but I what, I what I love about the book is that he actually points out, here's where the church actually did a poor job at this season. Here's a, 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 poor, a portion of the dark ages that the church has ignored. It's a great book. I would read it. I've read a fair amount of like Jennifer Glancy, but again, it's like, it's not, it's not in my area. So Thank you, Pat. Appreciate that. Bradford Baldwin says, Can't God say, Thou shalt not own a human as property? Then son affirm with stories of him freeing slaves while speaking about the evil of it. What's better for the all-knowing God to do, the above or 2,000 years debating it? So from my perspective, I wish that there would have been, thou shalt not own a human as property <laughs> from my perspective. But this is where, as me, as a follower of Jesus, I think, you know, I don't get this, but there's a lot of things that I don't get. And I, but I do see, I'm not like just blindly following it either. I'm also saying, hey, is this actually leading me towards the good? And that if you follow our argumentation, we do think that God does not tear down slavery through activism, but actually through the gospel, begin to transform people's hearts. So we do think there is ultimately an, a, an obliteration of slavery. And though I know this is argued in church history, at the front of the abolition of slavery, there are, certainly were a lot of Christians involved in that and at the forefront of it. Doesn't mean that they had all the right ideas, are, are, are the only ones that had those ideas, but they were certainly at the forefront of it. I love Kip's I love his looks. This is my well, favorite. Well, Link, yeah, I mean, even Lincoln himself would have tied that to a spiritual reason for what he did. I mean, um, yeah, and and then even some of the the slaves, like Frederick Douglass, uh, used the word jubilee a lot as a, a realm of hope. So, I mean, that's a whole nother. We get to, that. to to say it would be better though, just real quick, I, I left off a part of the question it would assume that I would actually be able to, to step out and see all the circumstances and how time when all the decisions made. And I just can't, from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, it sounds like maybe it'd be better to do it that way, but I don't have all the perspective. So I, I can't really say, speak from a place of authority on that. Kip, you, do you want to butt in on that before we take this question? So, I mean, I guess I, the, the, the problem with, uh, with drawing, uh, or I guess uh, uh, um, pointing to the abolitionists and their uh, um, the roots of the abolitionist movement in uh, the Christian uh, ethos. 
um, is that the the same holds uh, for the people on the other side? Uh, as 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 Jonathan was was talking, all I could hear in my head was there's was fine people on all sides, many oh, sides. Yeah. But would right. you make a distinction and, between modernism and like I, you know, the right. the 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 citation that I I concluded with in my in my concluding remarks is, you know, from one Christian perspective, you know, one of the great benefits of the African slave trade, um, insofar as it it had it in the minds of 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 those who believe such things expanded the kingdom yeah oh there's there, there's no doubt there's plenty of examples of that <laughs> plenty I, but there's also plenty that went the other direction and i could also say in early modernity um actually a part of the racial slavery was actually a, an application of some of the evolutionary thought at that time which we've moved way past that now i'm just saying that that was actually a force for <laughs> keeping slavery around too. So, I mean, we can, we could go back and forth and that's true, but I do think it's unmistakably um, a historical fact that Christians were at the forefront of the abolition in America. Thank you. Thank you. E-Rock says, Dr. Kip and Dr. Josh, do you believe the ways the Jews were commanded to practice slavery were moral? I'm not really sure how this word moral is being used here. So by what standard? Uh, if the question is, was it moral by their standards? Yes, uh, of course. Um, if, you're, if you're asking by modern sensibilities, uh, the, the practice of slavery in the Hebrew Bible, would that be considered moral? Again, I mean, I, I think it would depend on, on what you mean uh how how because if you're deriving some objective morality from and ethics is not my thing sorry but um so certainly not philosophy in general but um if you're trying to say that there's, there's some objective standard and that the hebrew bible or the the bible as a whole uh in what it's in what it says is the grounding for that and so you have like biblical values then in in that sense i mean what the biblical if you're if if you're a sort of divine command theory, you know, what the Bible says is moral or what the Bible says is good, then yes. I mean, it, it, you mean, that's, that's what the conclusion you would have to draw me personally. I don't even debate that question, right? Anybody that comes to me and says, well, you know, let's, let's debate whether slavery is, is moral. So sorry, that's where I start. Um, because it's not my field. Uh, I start that it's immoral. So yes, uh, I would say that, by modern standards, uh, yes, I would say that it was immoral, but I don't know if that's their question. Thank you so much. I imagine it is. Um, Pocket Locker 86, Jay in the house, go subscribe to Jay, he's two time PhD biologist, of you know, scientist, and whatnot. Anyway, he says the argument that the culture couldn't handle being told not to hold slaves seems ludicrous since he commanded them not to murder, lie, or covet. The thing I would make a note on this, though, culturally speaking, ancient Near East culture all had laws against murder, lying, yeah, and coveting. Exactly. And it's ridiculous. Um, so, um, and I'm sure, Bowen, I'm sure you would probably echo that point, even though we might come down to a wrong, a different conclusion on some things on that. But um, so I would say that murder, lying, and coveting in all those cultures, that was against the law. Holding slaves was the norm so to change that would affect um their relationship to other nations and if other nations are coming and they don't have any they don't have any property they don't have any things what do you do in that circumstance could there have been something different sure sure but israel had slaves they purchased slaves yeah, from yeah i think nation. it's a faulty comparison I mean, I, to, in his defense, I think that it the, the the comparison works under the assumption that you have, uh, if you're assuming that Yahweh is the one true God that is omnipotent, uh, and you know, Marduk or Shamash or Asher or whatever is not, uh, then I, then I think it, it is a valid question uh, because you're right. I mean, certainly the other 
you know, Near Eastern law collections. They're, they're, they're very much on par with what you see in the Hebrew Bible. But I think that's probably implicit in this question. Thank so, you. So, can, can, oh, go ahead. Yeah, we can move on. I'm sure you got more questions, but. Um, there's so many. You guys have so much to talk about. I guarantee you this is just going to make you want more. Bobby Goble, thank you so much for that, Bobby. Um, I really appreciate the support. I didn't even see a super chat. I almost or like a question or a comment or anything. And uh, I want to congratulate you for the first person who's just throwing money at us and not even. <laughs> it's been a long night. Is that their way of saying, let's hurry this thing up. I'll give you money to stop. I mean, what is it? I, I don't, I right, don't know. right. No, Bobby, thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate it. Oh, Bobby broke his own rule. Bobby in the house. Thank you so much, Bobby. <laughs> Dr. Boyce, Matthew 5, 17 through 18 is saying that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Wouldn't that include, include owning foreign slaves? Right, because his goal was to fulfill the law, not to, to to abolish it. But within fulfilling the law, things were about to change. Um, like when you when you deal with it, so what what is the problem? What is the heart problem behind slavery? Like that's why does slavery exist to begin with? From our perspective, slavery exists because man is inherently evil, and within the evil of man there's this idea of subduing, subjecting others, whether it's for an inferior feeling, whatever the thing is, we would say the root problem of slavery is a sin problem. Jesus didn't come to alleviate the symptom of the problem. He came to give the solution of the problem because if God changes the heart of a man, slavery goes away. And that's what you're seeing in Philemon. A man like Philemon came to understand who Jesus was, what he did and became a follower of his. Paul's championing that man on to now apply that same thing by, by looking at Onesimus the way that he does. So again, it's God first got the heart of Philemon, which then alleviated the whole, no longer a slave, but a brother. So for our perspective, yeah, Jesus didn't say he was coming to abolish it. He said he was coming to fulfill it and fulfilling it is to meeting the criteria of qualification. First of all, of his messiahship. Secondly, to accomplish obedience to something that others could not because nobody obeyed the law. And that's what Paul said, uh, all sin. So in this fulfillment of the law, it is releasing the sin problem. The heart of all sin or the heart of all the problems is a sin problem, including slavery. So what good is it to make laws against slavery? We're seeing it now. We have freedom against slavery today. And as Josh, uh, Dr. Bowen said that he still talks to people that, that are like mad about it. You can have freedom from slavery in a country. And I think we should, by the way. I'm just saying like that doesn't solve the problem of people's hearts. You can live in a free country where there's no slavery and people still want it. There's still a heart issue there. So Jesus was starting with the heart and working into the culture, not just changing a culture. Thank you so much. Margaret DeVelden in the house with the 20 on, I think it's like Canadian. Thank you so much. And Margaret, I looked and... You may be the official first person who did not come up with any question, but let's see if let's see if, let's see what happens as we scroll down. Who knows? Thank you so much, Margaret. Appreciate the support and being a member, a Patreon member. Uh, you cover all the check boxes and stuff, so thank you. Uh, courageous. Can Doctor Boise stop being anti-Semitic, please? Ouch. How? I don't understand how I'm being anti-Semitic. Honestly, I don't recall. But, if he, uh, if, think, if you heard him, I, I'll just assure you that he's, um, he's not. <laughs> in that I, way. But I, I, sorry. So I, I would say I, I actually have a lot of close and I mean, close friends that are like, I, they, they would actually be astonished at that kind of comment. They would. I wonder if, and I'm going to just guess on courageous part. I wonder if it is the whole cessation. Like this was only for certain people at a certain time kind of thing. Jews today actually think this is a permanent everlasting thing. Whereas your perspective may be budding with that kind of thing. So that may be. Well, where that's, this but that's, it, well, and if that's the case that that is, that's incorrect too, because actually uh, the Jewish rabbi, friends that i am very close to actually would 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 actually agree with our perspective and say that the jews messed up bad badly in this and they actually look bad at their history and how they didn't uh follow law, the law properly and that they did mistreat and that they didn't follow jubilee laws um they actually condemn a lot of their practices 
for not seeing the heartbeat of the law. And, and I don't want to speak for them, but I, I, being that close to them, I know their perspective and, and that wouldn't, again, that's just, that's a, that, that's a pot shot that has no stability to it. Well, I will say too, that, um, when it comes to, uh, we don't equate like a disagreement of interpretation with any type of hatred of somebody saying, oh. this is what this should be. This is what, how you should interpret this. If Josh pushes back against my interpretation, I'm like you're an anti me person, aren't you? Just cause you're always pushing back against me type of thing. So I think, um, sometimes it can come across that way when it, when it gets heated. And so, well, now being we're going to mention the Jews a lot. This is their texts. I mean, these are their texts. These are their laws. This was dedicated to their country and their covenant. So I, I, I don't see this. Thanks for responding. Floyd FP question for the panel. Doesn't Galatians three twenty eight apply to a person's salvation and not their social status? No, actually it applies to, um, the context of the church. Like, so they're already saved people. So, um, if you want to say salvation, as far as a salvation, as a ongoing, this is the reality of what God's doing in saving me, then yes, it, but it involves the community, which is the social status within the church, but not necessarily within all the social structures. And I think that was one of the arguments as well. I think maybe built up in the question is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, if you have three distinctions being made in the verse, uh, Jew nor Gentile, uh, slave male nor free, female. male nor female, certainly with the first and the third, those social distinctions or the, what I mean, like the, the, the practical distinctions are not done away with. Right. It's the right. reason that the text says in yep. Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think using that verse to then say um, that we're now we're leveling socially, practically, whatever um, these distinctions between male and female, Jew and Gentile, slave and free. Uh, right. Okay. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Th th I, I appreciate the clarification. So socially, how that played out, though, like just say Jew and Gentile, this is actually something that Peter rebukes Paul. I mean, Paul rebukes Peter. I'm getting tired. <laughs> Paul rebukes Peter in Galatians 2 when he was um, he was saying the gospel no longer has this divide between Jew and Gentile. But during mealtimes, uh, Jews would separate from Gentiles. And Peter said or Paul said to Peter, you're not in step with the gospel on that particular um, application so that spiritual distinction did have social ramifications to it and then you also had a patriarchal culture that began to and i and i you may disagree with this but i do think there is a development of the treatment of women from old to new testament i think there's a development i'm not saying it's up to our sensibilities but i think there is a development well the context of Galatians three is going back to the Abrahamic covenants. The very next verse talks about you're you're the descendants of Abraham by faith. So it's it's now you're an heir, you're an heir. So therefore, God is your father. It's family placement. So it tears down the construct of societal differences for the purpose of you are now all heirs of Almighty God of Abraham. So it's it's removing barriers in the kingdom of God. And ultimately that doesn't always play out immediately in society on this side. It's more of the Abraham's promise was an eternal promise. So therefore in the new heaven, new earth, the new kingdom that restored Eden, this is the way it's going to be. So th there's a lot playing out there into chapter four as well. So to clarify, say, yeah. masters and slaves would leave the assembly still as masters and slaves. Yeah. 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 I think exactly. that's my, I, th I think that's the point yeah. that he was trying to make with it. Okay. Is that so nobody I, I, walked sorry, away from I, that saying, oh shit, we shouldn't have slaves anymore. Like, I don't think they walked away like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Exactly that. No. Floyd, I appreciate sorry. the super chat and, and gentlemen, we're trying to work through these rest. Please no more super chats so that these, uh, everybody can go eat and uh, get some rest tonight. I'm trying to scroll up here after I dropped that comment. It's, brought me back to the bottom so bear with me for one second i'm almost there oh here we are uh tang gang in the house go check out oz's youtube channel and subscribe the answer is yes 
Also, our Dr. Josh and Dr. Kill ready to do some Trinity Radio shenanigans tomorrow night. Love you, Derek. Yeah, I mean, you guys should definitely tune in for that. Uh, you know, Oz has been working very hard oh, yeah. to earn his uh, doctoral degree, and it will yes. be conferred upon him tomorrow night. I'm very excited about it. Oh, I'm missing out on something here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there an it's inside like, joke? There it's got to yeah. be, yeah. yeah. Yes, there you is. Gotta tune I, it. I, like, wow. yes. <laughs> I know Josh too well not to see it you on his watch. face. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, he's got a really good dissertation. To, it's embargoed, right? It's embargoed. So you, you don't have access yeah. to it. It's embargoed. No. But um, oh yeah, my it's, it, it's a real dissertation yeah. that he really wrote. So do Definitely. you know this person? Who is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. It's yeah, Oz is... at uh, the Atheist Network Group. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, he's buddy. Yeah. Thank you so much, Oz. Imnag, thank you for the super chat. Did you have a comment? Make sure I didn't leave you hanging. You would be the second person who... Quick, Derek, don't encourage him. I know, right? <laughs> I already said no no more super chats, so please respect that if you're watching. Um, okay, scrolling to the next. Here we are. Zerg in the house. Thank you both uh, to both Boyce Beasley. Uh, based on your response about being a slave to sin versus free under God, is there an option in which one can avoid being a slave at all or is slavery a given? Are you talking about in the Old Testament? I would say... Not I think it was referring to earlier when Boyce was discussing saying you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. And it's almost like the way Zerg's question is sounds like you don't have an option. It's like you have to be a slave no matter what in this, so in this the, ordeal. It's a theological question, of course, yes, from a right, theological yeah. um, perspective, we would say, yeah, you're, you're going to be a slave to either one of these things um but obviously if you're rejecting this notion altogether uh, there's different worldviews on that but from a biblical standpoint yeah you're you're going to serve someone um yeah uh, even if uh, you're turning to say i'm going to serve myself you're end up you're ending up becoming the slave of something or some type of idea or some type of desire you know yeah. but it also de depends on how you frame it too so yeah and and, and this wasn't a off the wall example for Paul to use as a way of comparison, because everybody in the cultures of that time saw themselves, especially if you're under a King, they saw themselves as slaves uh, to, to a certain degree. I mean, this is one of the warnings in first Samuel chapter eight that God gave uh, the people of Israel. They're like, well, we want a King like everybody else. He's like, all right, well, let me tell you what that looks like. And the very last line that he tells them is, and you will be his slaves. So the idea in that culture to use, being a slave to something to a greater or lesser degree was not uncommon. So for Paul, especially under a Roman empire, um, for Jews predominantly who experienced taxation and oppression from the Romans, for him to use a greater less than taskmaster versus a kind uh, servant kind of perspective was not an uncommon example for him to say, this is what slave slavery is for you and your sin. This is what it's like to be a bond servant of Christ. To me, that that's, that's, he's using a common concept. They could all relate with at that time to make a theological statement. Thank you so much, Zerg. Appreciate that. Dylan clap in the house. Is there any way to arrive at a grand narrative of the Bible that isn't packed with theological assumptions that will seem subjective or arb and arbitrary to a skeptic? Sure. Yeah, that's why you have to go through each section. That's why we started with Genesis 3, the concept of loving your neighbor, moving into the prophets, how they evaluated these things and had to learn to practice them. This was a consistency. <clears throat> We're not doing a general just survey, just like hoping that this is what, what it'll turn out to be in the end. And we didn't get to go through all of these things. I know we, we vaguely referenced Isaiah and some Jeremiah, et cetera, but you know, we could sit here and go through meta narratives of every individual, whether you're talking about the Tanakh or the Torah or various sections around it in the Psalms, where you find this redemptive narrative or even this Edenic restored narrative over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again, where there's consistency throughout. Uh, that grand narrative is built on small narratives within these texts that continually have the same theme of redemption, redemption, redemption. So, that that would be my answer <clears throat> to that question. Can I can I just say, as a, as a skeptic who was once uh, quite quite deeply committed to discovering the grand narrative 
in Chris in uh, scripture that uh, once you've pulled back the curtain, taken a look inside, and then stepped in there and basically lived out your um, um, your studies and your questions in exploring the roots of this the very idea of a meta narrative of scripture becomes more and more absurd you know you sound like an evangelist <laughs> like, like if you guys really no. knew what it feels like to follow jesus and pull back the curtain no, I just, I couldn't, you're, you're <laughs> oh, it's true i really am just i'm just teasing with you dr kip i'm sorry i just could help to I lo- pull the punch it's I'm fun not the it's funny because um, i was i was heading toward his altar to you interrupted <laughs> beasley i mean this is just <laughs> Every head our, out and but, if, but if you really are yeah. interested in coming to the altar, I am putting together a course. <laughs> yes, he is. So yeah, we're actually going to be recording a course on ancient Israelite religion. So All that's right. coming up. Um, Imnag is in the house. Imnag, you broke the agreement, but it's okay. I don't. Uh, you're throwing money at me. I can't argue with you. Being a former Christian, it really upsets me to hear pastors say how morality is what it is because of Christianity. I really see them as being ignorant to the clear evidence. I would love to talk about what evidence do you have to the contrary, but I don't know where you're coming from on it. From our perspective, so every worldview has an origin story that they can't prove. So there's assumptions. This goes back to the other question. We all have assumptions, and we're all actually a bit skeptical because we don't all have the information in any worldview. <laughs> so, there's, so there's always um, going to be a level of uh, being skeptical. But um, I do think Christians need to be careful about pretending to have the monopoly on all information and all knowledge. Oh, yes. And sometimes that's really hurtful to the Christian faith. But I do think that it is fair for us to say, hey, we have these convictions, and there is a – there is it's not just based on something – arbitrary or something kind of pie in the sky there is evidence to the particular faith and actually at explore christianity that's one thing that we seek to do now i'm being the evangelist kept um what we seek to do (laughs) is actually to lay out like this is the true evidence of christianity and here's the evidence and you'll see you hear sometimes we'll say yeah that's actually not really good evidence well that's actually not being really fair or no actually christians weren't the first to think of that we truly want to be fair but none of us all None of us get it all right. And so to, I, to I be, get what you're saying, but I would push to, back a little bit. To be fair to the the person asking the question, they may have had a horrible experience that was in a church yeah. with certain pastors, which I can't even begin to tell you how many pastors John and I have spoken for or talked to over the last eight to 10 years where we cringe. Um. This, as John said, like this Christianity has a monopoly on truth. If it wasn't discovered by a, tr- a Christian, it's not really true, et cetera. Like we, I don't know your experience and I'm sure that there's some validity to your concern or statement there because we know pastors like you're describing <clears throat> and um, we're working really hard as Christian apologists in our network to train and encourage pastors to be different than that. So I'm, we're sorry you had the experiences that you did at the same time without knowing all the details, but we, we can understand why that perspective is given. Thank you so much for that. I commend you to do that. So M minder bender, when does a progressive revealing of the immorality of slavery become a rationalization for slavery or any other immoral practice? Thanks guys. Does. My my mind is obviously getting slower. I hear the yeah, question. So my, my oh, I need hurts. to read it. Uh, when if you don't does, get it right, I'm going to burn you alive right now. No, I'm just kidding. So now, now <laughs> what I'm doing is like, Doctor Bowen, can you interpret this? I like, think I yeah. I think what they're saying is that it, depending on where we are. Uh, so uh, maybe um, maybe uh, homosexuality would be a good example of this. If right now. Um, the, the evangelical church says that uh, homosexuality is a sin. 
right? And that rights of uh, members of the LGBTQ community should be, um, you know, limited or whatever, restricted. If 200 years from now, uh, the church realizes, wait a second, you know, actually we've either misunderstood these texts or whatever, that, that, that there's been moral progress to the point that it becomes clear to even evangelicals or whatever that, uh, you know, homosexuality is not a sin. Does that leave us right now? Uh, uh, this, this idea of, uh, justifying, uh, ill treatment of the LGBTQ community, uh, and justifying it based on this progressive revelation of, uh, the immorality or the morality of something. I think I yeah. did that. Yeah. That's, that's a great, like a great comparison. And I think you would like, I think you would agree probably like in, at least for this point, I made the, I, I made the point. It was like, does, does God actually command slavery? And of course, Dr. Kip brought up social reasons why that may not work because not everyone can own a slave or whatever. Um, I do think that there is clear uh, communication of like, what is, um, what is marriage? What is the ideal, you know, that I don't think th so there's a lot more clarity on ramifications for what marriage is, what this relationship should look like. Um, so, but I do think you'll probably have, you will have, um, a group of Christians that will continue to progress and they'll try to progress in a way that says, Hey, how can we, um, you know, be socially, you know, socially acceptable and still kind of carry the banner for Jesus, you know, type of thing. I, I would push like, and, and Stephen would agree with this. Like if I had the choice between progressive Christianity and like being agnostic or atheist, I would go the atheist agnostic route oh, just yeah. because after, after a while you just kind of lose anything that would be any sense of like, does Christianity and this mean anything after a while? And they just keep changing, changing with the times. And I do think that there is a uh, like a point, a good point this be making here about progression. But I do think there are certain things that we see moving towards the idea of loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbors yourself. There's a progression towards that. Um, but I there there is a, a part two where there's going to be some social ways to say loving God and loving my neighbor is actually in contradiction to culture here. You know, they have a different view of what this looks like than what we think will lead to human flourishing. So here's the church's view of human flourishing. Here's society. And sometimes there's going to be a contradiction. And I think the church needs to stand, but yet be very gracious with their stand on that. So I do think, unfortunately, there has been a lot of us versus them and hateful things and not listening and having conversations. Uh, or just kind of preaching at people. And I, I think that's unfortunate. So I don't know if that answers, um, or maybe I just chased her out. You're like, would he stop talking, please? <laughs> maybe. Both? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Ayo Guz, thank you so much for the super chat. Deuteronomy 2542 states that the Israelites are Yahweh's slaves and therefore cannot treat each other as chattel slaves. It is no double dipping kind of thing. It's a do no double dipping kind of thing. Yeah, I think he means Leviticus. Um, he's probably just typing that out quick. AL is pretty, pretty sharp. So, yeah, this is a statement, not a question. Did you want to make a remark about that? or? Oh, no, I agree with him completely. Um, and I think so that's the... Leviticus 25 states that Israel are Yahweh's slaves and therefore cannot treat uh, each other as chattel slaves. Yeah, I think they're... Um, in Exodus 21, there were debt slaves of Hebrews. You know, if you... Do there's a, quite a bit of study on the term, you know, Hebrew slaves with Exodus 21. I think it really does mean Hebrew slaves, and they could be debt slaves. Um, but I think here there is actually an advancement. Would you would you agree with that, Bowen? Like there's an, an advancement from Exodus. You might say a disagreement, maybe. No, I, I mean, I, I'm going to probably say another thing that you wouldn't agree with, but I mean, it's, it's part of the holiness code, right? Which I think is written significantly later. Um, and it's in response to specific response to, there's a good article. I think Levinson wrote it. Um, but it, it, it I, I don't, I don't think there's much dissent, uh, or disagreement among scholars, uh, that, that work in this field. When it comes to like Van Cedars would make a make an argument against it, but um, that 
you know, Covenant Code is first, chronologically speaking, then Deuteronomy 15, uh, and then the Holiness Code is responding to both of those. But that's gotcha. why, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Last one. Anonymous. Spartacus was right. Paul was wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate the... Uh, Support everybody and all of your questions. I think we covered them all. Just scrolling down to make sure because I, I said no more after that. Everybody was good. Everybody obeyed the laws of myth vision here. And um, I hope it, you know, they abide by those. Because if they don't, uh, anyway, I really appreciate you all. Everybody, we did our we did our closings. We had the debate. It seems like a lot more can be discussed and further evaluations, reviews on both sides of what was said and how you feel about it. You know, all that stuff may come. You may see other channels do it. I really appreciate you all. Is there any final, just, I don't know, a few sentences you'd like to say each before we let you go? I was just going to say, you guys expected me to speak first, didn't you? No, I was going to say that I really <laughs> do. Be quiet, Dr. Kip. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that I really appreciate you guys. Like, um, I came into this thinking, like, I know I'm going to learn from these guys, and I appreciate the amount of. Uh, diligence that you have in the your studies and that we disagree fundamentally on this particular topic um, I definitely have gone back and felt challenged and thought hey I need to look more into that Jeremiah 34 or Leviticus 25 so I appreciate that and uh, hopefully you won't mind me maybe shooting an email to you here and there to bug you yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to echo that too. And, uh, appreciate you guys, your disposition and, uh, how we handled this whole situation. And, and uh, again, there's more to be talked about and I know we didn't get to touch on so many of the specifics. Um, but, um, and, and Dr. Kip, I, I, wa I'm watching all your new releases. So I've got my eyes because manuscripts is more so new Testament, but I, I have a nerd fetish for the old Testament <laughs> manuscripts too. So, uh, I can't wait as you keep releasing you're on mute you're muted praise god well, i was i was just <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't even have to plug the series <laughs> oh, i get worse as it gets later <laughs> oh, that's so funny. uh thanks steven and and thank you jonathan i i had a this was fun um you uh i i i think it it, it, it was probably uh productive on some levels um so I guess to everybody else out there, I would uh, I would say uh, keep giving Derek the love. Uh, check out uh, the Dead Sea Scroll series, and don't treat each other like slaves. Hmm. We agree. Yeah, and I, I I I tend to try to say this at the end of these kinds of discussions, but I mean for me the most important aspect of this, um, I don't really think is going to be an issue with anything that we've talked about tonight, and that is. That when you when you begin to defend um, aspects, uh, even more fundamental aspects of uh, slavery laws in the Hebrew Bible, it becomes incredibly dangerous because the rationale that is used uh, or that was used in uh, the laws of the Hebrew Bible um, are are mirrored quite closely in what we see in the legal sections or in the laws of the antebellum South. And that surprises people a lot when they discover that, it just surprised me. Um, and so this, this rationale, for example, that, well, you know, slaves aren't going to be motivated to do things. So you have to be able to beat them. The master has to be able to beat them, but they can't beat them, you know, above moderate correction. You know, while that, you know, to, to certain, again, nobody here, but like certain people that I argue with will say like, They'll, they'll argue that, right? And I'm, well, how else are you supposed to motivate them? And it's like, oh my God, you don't, you don't seem to see that making that argument opens the door for history to be repeated because we saw what happened when that, when that rationale was used. And uh, as I, I just, I really appreciate um, that that's not the direction this way. It went a different direction than I anticipated. It's a very theological discussion, which is certainly not my area of expertise, but yeah. uh, no, it was good. And these guys are very kind and I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of you. You did really, really well. There was one moment I was like, 
they're fighting. They're about to fight. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, this went really well. I really appreciate you all. I also thank everybody for the support through Super Chats. You really help keep the platform going so we can have these in the future. And I love that. I, I got to pat ourselves on the back, pat all of yourselves, because I love that Myth Vision, while I am a very skeptical channel and I do all this stuff, but when we have these debates, it's not uh, all out war. It's actually intellectual. There's actual great conversations that can come of it. And you learn a lot. So subscribe to the channel, go subscribe to their YouTube channels, keep up with what the arguments are on all sides. I always want people to learn from everywhere you can. So you understand where people are coming from and having these conversations are great. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to check out the description. Um, their link is there. And guys, if you have any links that I need to add, feel free to send them all at them anytime. Never forget. We are myth vision.